Committee will come to order. Uh, before we begin, I have one housekeeping matter. As soon as we adjourn the public hearing, uh, we will immediately move upstairs for a classified briefing, and we'll also be asking questions in reverse order of seniority today. Uh, today we begin our fiscal 2025 posture hearings for NORTHCOM and SOUTHCOM. I want to thank our witnesses for being here today and for their service to our nation. Uh, in eight months, President Z is expected to visit Peru, uh, inaugurate a brand to, to inaugurate a brand new $3.6 billion megaport. It was financed by China, built by Chinese workers, and it will be owned and operated by the CCP backed company. It will be used to ship South American copper lithium and other critical materials to China to further their military modernization. This is just the latest effort, uh, latest China, of China's efforts to displace American influence and build a strategic footprint in our backyard. 25 of the 31 countries in the Southcom AOR are welcomed or have welcomed infrastructure investment from China. 22 have formally joined China's Belt and Road Initiative. China is investing in critical sectors across Latin America, including sea, space, telecommunication, critical minerals, and energy. CCP-backed companies currently own or operate mines in Mexico, Argentina, Peru, and Venezuela, electrical grids in Peru and Chile, 5G wireless systems in Costa Rica and Bolivia, Brazil and Mexico, space launch and satellite tracking facilities in Peru, Venezuela, Bolivia, Argentina, as well as 40 ports across 16 Latin American and Caribbean countries. That includes ports on both ends of the Panama Canal, one at the tip of South America, and one just 100 miles away in the Bahamas. None of the agreements governing these port space and telecommunication projects ban the collection of intelligence by China, and none of them ban the PLA from using them for military operations. In fact, many of these countries already share intelligence, host port calls, buy military equipment, and receive training from the PLA. Unfortunately, China is not the only malign influence in the Western Hemisphere. Since Putin's illegal invasion of Ukraine, Russian propaganda efforts have increased across Latin America. Russia continues to invest heavily in Cuba's communist regime. And, military, and, and its military continues to provide training and arms to Venezuela, Cuba, and Nicaragua, where Russia has over 200 troops operating a satellite tracking station. Recent unrest in SOUTHCOM AOR is also very troubling. Over the weekend, U.S. forces were sent to Haiti to help evacuate non-essential embassy personnel. Meanwhile, Venezuela continues to threaten its neighbors by moving thousands of troops to its borders. We need to do more to encourage stability in this region. This means we must build and enhance partnerships to further our security interest in the region. We also need to focus on real threat transitional crim uh, transnational criminal organizations based in the region and what they pose to our nation. These brutal criminals prey on thousands of vulnerable men, women, and children. They steal their money and endanger their lives with perilous attempts to gain illegal entry at our borders. Last year, CBP encountered nearly two and a half million migrants trying to illegal cross in, illegally cross into our southwest border. That set a new record. And to make matters worse, that number includes at least 169 individuals on the terrorist watch list, 598 known gang members, and 178 of which were MS-13 gang members. Keep in mind, these are just the ones that the CBP caught. CBP estimates that another 1.7 million illegal immigrants got away. South and Central American criminal organizations are also the main source of fentanyl and other dangerous drugs smuggled across our southern border. In FY23, a record 27,000 pounds of fentanyl were seized at the southwest border, enough to kill 6 billion people, 
and that's what was seized, not what got in. Nearly 3,000 military personnel are deployed to the U.S. border, the largest U.S. deployment of forces in the Western Hemisphere. NORTHCOM and SOUTHCOM are doing their best to try to provide support to civilian authorities to address the border crisis, but the real solution rests with our president. He needs to drop the excuses and secure our border. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses and getting their best military advice on how to overcome these security challenges that we face. And with that, I yield to my uh, friend, the ranking member, Mr. Panetta, for any questions he may, or comments he may have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate this opportunity to sit in for ranking member Adam Smith, but I'd also like to welcome our witnesses for our hearing today. Ms. Rebecca Zimmerman, performing the duties of Assistant Secretary of Defense for Homeland Defense and Hemispheric Affairs. General Laura Richardson, welcome back as, the, again, the Commander of U.S. Southern C Command. And General Gregory Guillo, Commander of U.S. Northern Command and Northern North American Aerospace Defense Command in his first appearance before the committee after taking command in February. It's appropriate for our first posture hearing to be focused on the defense of the United States. What happens here at home and in our neighborhood is of the utmost importance to securing our national interest. I appreciate Ms. Zimmerman's focus on the new Homeland Defense Policy Guidance in her testimony and look forward to additional detail about the what the Department intends to improve in its resilience across DOD, the interagency, and our civil society to ensure that we can deter and, if necessary, survive and prevail against any adversary who chooses to test our defenses. I also look forward to hearing about the progress of General Guillaume's initial review upon taking command, as well as his and Ms. Zimmerman's views on the Department's support to civilian authorities at the southern border, unidentified anomalous phenomena, and DOD and national interests in the High North and NORTHCOM. Further, I hope to understand NORAD's posture and future requirements with respect to integrated air and missile defense particularly in regard to increasing our domain aware awareness regardless of the type of threat or origin. I expect to encourage General Guillo and Ms. Zimmerman to speak to the threats to our national security in strategic, cyber, and traditional domains and across the full geographic breadth of our country. Strategic competitors are active in the SOUTHCOM region and often engage in activities that undermine the rules-based order. Despite other global events that are, require our attention, we should not ignore our own hemisphere. The Department needs to engage in agile and adaptive ways in the region where resources can be limited. In SOUTHCOM, in Southcom the Department continues to pursue security cooperation activities that enhance our partners' ability to address challenges in the region like drug trafficking, migrant flows, and the fallout of the humanitarian crisis in Venezuela. Such activities can effectively build the capacity of our partners while also deterring malign activity and aggression in the region. I'm interested in hearing how such activities build capacity and to the extent to which they reinforce human rights. And yes, we are keeping an eye on the situation in Haiti. The Department is currently supporting the Multinational Stability Support Mission and augmenting security at the U.S. Embassy, and I encourage General Richardson to speak about these missions. Finally, I will repeat my concluding question at our, to our witnesses from last year. How do we continue to protect the United States, continue to build our partnerships with the countries of the Western Hemisphere, and continue to keep an eye on efforts that may undermine the United States' interests. I thank the witnesses for being here, and I look forward to hearing their testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce the witnesses. <clears throat> we have the Honorable Rebecca Zimmerman, is Acting Principal Deputy Secretary of Defense for Homeland Defense and Hemispheric Affairs. It's a pretty long title. General Laura Richardson, Commander, U.S. United States Southern Command. General Gregory Gillo. How do you pronounce that? Chairman, it's Guillo. Guillo. Thank you. All right. General, General Gregory Guillo is the commander of the United States Northern Command and Northern Aerospace Defense Command. I welcome the witnesses. Ms. Zimmerman, we'll start with you. You're recognized for five minutes. 
Thank you. Chairman Rogers, uh, Ranking Member Smith, and Congressman Panetta standing in, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. I'll highlight how we're putting homeland defense and other interests across the hemisphere front and center to implement the 2022 National Defense Strategy. But I want to first acknowledge the tragic helicopter crash on the southwest border on Friday afternoon uh, that killed two New York National Guardsmen, uh, Casey Frankowski and John Gracia, uh, and also uh, U.S. Border Patrol agent Chris Luna. On behalf of the Department of Defense, I extend our sincere condolences to the families of those lost. The 2022 NDS states that the department's top priority is defense of the homeland, paced to the growing multi-domain threat posed by the People's Republic of China. Per the NDS, the PRC is the pacing challenge for DOD, while Russia remains an acute threat. The PRC and Russia currently pose more dangerous challenges to safety and security to the U.S. homeland. But the NDS also ensures vigilance of other persistent threats. North Korea is expanding its nuclear and missile capability to threaten the homeland. Iran is testing space launch technologies, and global terrorist groups require continued monitoring. Emerging technologies pose new challenges to strategic stability and demand that we adapt and adjust our posture, deterring adversaries from employing advanced threats by denying them the benefits of their aggression. As small, uncrewed aircraft systems proliferate in the open market and their costs decrease as their capabilities rapidly increase, um, the threat of these small UAS is becoming more prominent. Our nation also continues to face the challenge of natural and man-made hazards. Last year, the U.S. homeland endured 114 incidents, 24 more than in 2022, caused by natural hazards including severe storms, tornadoes, hurricanes, floods, and wildfires. In December of 2023, Secretary Austin approved a classified homeland defense policy guidance, updating the department's approach to homeland defense to account for major changes in the global security environment. We have shared this classified document with the Congress and plan to publish an unclassified version later this year. The guidance looks to meet the challenges we face today by driving action across the department to deter threats of aggression or strategic attack to the homeland across multiple domains and the spectrum of conflict. It identifies initiatives that contribute to DOD's ability to project power, defend the homeland, and in the event of a conflict, maintain continuity of wartime operations. Those initiatives link to the 2022 NDS and ensure that DOD will deter aggression against the homeland, improve resilience to an attack across the spectrum of conflict, focus on defending defense critical infrastructure against attacks, ensure continuity of operations and continuity of government, build resiliency against the impacts of climate change, and ensure resilience in chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear response capabilities associated with homeland defense missions. Defense Support of Civil Authorities, or DISCA, is an important activity supporting the American public and our partners, responding to disasters, public health emergencies, and securing our borders. Per the NDS, DOD is prepared to support DISCA activities that do not impair warfighting readiness. Today, between 2,500 and 3,000 military personnel are deployed to the southwest border supporting U.S. Customs and Border Protection activities. DOD has supported DHS's border security mission for 18 of the last 21 years. The United States derives immense benefit from a stable, peaceful, and democratic Western Hemisphere that reduces security threats to our nation. We're deepening partnerships with Canada, Mexico, Brazil, Colombia, and Chile, while reinforcing democratic institutions, civilian control of the military, and respect for human rights and the rule of law. In February, Secretary Austin participated in the North American Defense Ministerial with his counterparts from Mexico and Canada. DOD is working to fulfill and sustain the department's supporting role in Central America and the Caribbean, institutional capacity building, and humanitarian assistance and disaster response. In addition, the department is participating in U.S. government efforts to support a U.N.-backed multinational security support mission in Haiti to assist the Haitian National Police. Our relationships in the hemisphere help ensure we can conduct humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, bolster cyber defenses, promote climate resilience, and conduct pandemic response. To conclude, the department is committed to defending the homeland and pursuing U.S. interests in the Western Hemisphere and the Arctic. Thank you for your support of the Department of Defense, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Ms. Zimmerman. General Richardson, you're recognized. 
Chairman Rogers, Ranking Member Panetta, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you with Assistant Secretary Zimmerman and General Guillo. I am honored to represent the dedicated men and women of U.S. Southern Command to discuss the challenges we share with our neighbors in Latin America and the Caribbean. Our national security strategy recognizes the direct link between this region's security and our own security. We are harnessing the power of partnership from Team USA in support of Team Democracy by leveraging all instruments of national power, diplomacy, information, military, and economics to expeditiously assist partner nations in addressing the challenges that impact our collective security. This region, which is our shared neighborhood, remains under assault from a host of cross-cutting transboundary challenges that directly threaten our homeland. I have seen these challenges intensify since I met with you last year, and this remains a call to action. In almost two and a half years in command, I've made it my priority to meet our partners where they are and to listen and understand the challenges that affect us all. The world is at an inflection point. Our partners in the Western Hemisphere, with whom we are bonded by trade, share values, democratic traditions, family ties, and increasingly impacted impacted by interference and coercion, I've learned that our presence absolutely matters. The People's Republic of China has exploited the trust of democracies in this hemisphere, using that trust to steal national secrets, intellectual property, and research related to academia, agriculture, and healthcare. The scope and scale of this espionage is unprecedented. Through the Belt and Road Initiative, the PRC aims to amass power and influence at the expense of the world's democracies. Here in the Western Hemisphere, Latin America and the Caribbean have the potential to feed and fuel the world. Understanding this, the PRC is already busy extracting and exploiting. Predatory investment practices, construction of megaports and dual-use space facilities, and criminal cyber activities are just a few of the PRC's malign activities that jeopardize the sovereignty and safety of the region. Russia remains an acute threat and seeks to increase its foothold by bolstering authoritarian regimes in Cuba, Nicaragua, and Venezuela. In the last year, China, Russia, and Iran have increased their presence diplomatically, economically, and mil even militarily in the region. These activities undermine democracies and challenge their credibility. Both China and Russia exploit the presence of transnational criminal organizations and amplify their destabilizing impacts on democratic governments. TCOs traffic weapons, drugs, people, gold, lithium, rare earth minerals, commodities, and counterfeit goods while contributing to the surge of fentanyl-related deaths here at home. The good news is working with our very willing partners leads to the best defense. We must use all available levers to strengthen our partnerships with the 28 like-minded democracies in this hemisphere who understand the, per the power of working together to counter these shared threats. The United States remains the per preferred and most trusted security partner in the region. We build trust through investment in security cooperation programs that train and equip our partner militaries and security forces a robust joint exercise program to build interoperability and the development and employment of emerging technologies. Moreover, we maximize the resources allocated by the Department of State's International Military Education and Training Program, or IMET, foreign military financing, foreign military sales to build interoperability and counterbalance the PRC's military engagements and investments. As the national defense strategy states, the U.S. derives immense benefit from a stable, peaceful, and democratic Western Hemisphere that reduces security threats to the homeland. U.S. Southcom continues to innovate and adapt, putting integrated deterrence into action every day. We remain committed to working across all domains with allies and partners, combatant commands, the Joint Force, the U.S. Interagency, non-federal entities, and the United States Congress to guarantee safety, security, and prosperity throughout the Western Hemisphere. This work and promise of U.S. Southcom as a part of Team USA in support of Team Democracy is our pledge. Thank you for your assistance in resourcing this team. Uh, I, I look forward to your questions. Thank you.
Thank you, General Richardson. General Gio, you're recognized five minutes. Chairman Rogers, Ranking Member Panetta, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. It's a profound honor to command and represent the men and women of North American Aerospace Defense Command and United States Northern Command. And I thank Ms. Zimmerman for acknowledging the sacrifice of two soldiers and a Border Patrol agent, as well as remembering the injured soldier from last week's helicopter crash along the southwest border in Texas. As we speak this morning, American and Canadian military and civilian personnel from both commands are actively defending our homelands against significant, persistent threats from multiple vectors in all domains. Although I've only been in command a few weeks, it is readily clear to me that the United States, Canada, and our expansive network of partners are facing an extraordinarily complex strategic environment. Competitors seeking to diminish our military and economic advantage have fielded advanced kinetic systems designed to strike military and civilian infrastructure in North America, both above and below the nuclear threshold. Meanwhile, competitors have rapidly advanced and routinely use non-kinetic capabilities targeting our critical infrastructure and essential networks. Threats to the homeland are present in all domains along all avenues of approach to include the Arctic region. As stated in the National Defense Strategy, the People's Republic of China remains our pacing challenge as the People's Liberation Army modernizes and grows at a rapid pace. The PRC's expanding nuclear capability and capacity, along with its development of modern submarines, missiles, and hypersonic weapons, all present significant challenges for homeland defense. While the PRC's capabilities are growing quickly, Russia remains a threat to the homeland today and is an immediate nation state concern. Russia retains the world's largest stockpile of strategic and non-strategic nuclear weapons, along with significant capacity to strike inside North America with its air and sea launched precision conventional weapons. Despite heavy losses to its ground forces in Ukraine, Russia has invested heavily in systems that can threaten the United States, such as advanced guided missile submarines, hypersonic glide vehicles, ICBMs, as well as significant cyber and undersea capabilities and developmental systems such as a nuclear torpedo and a nuclear-powered cruise missile. Meanwhile, North Korea continues its bellicose rhetoric while test-launching increasingly advanced long-range missiles and expanding its ties with China and Russia. While Iran currently lacks the capability to strike North America with long-range missiles, it is investing heavily in that capability. Iran also supports violent militant groups in the Middle East and maintains a worldwide network of operational surrogates. And the most prevalent and growing threats include cyber and small unmanned aerial systems that are being employed inside the U.S. and Canada against civilian and military infrastructure in ways that were not possible a few years ago. With those risks firmly in mind, NORAD and NORTHCOM strive to begin homeland defense well beyond North America. To do so, both commands are working with the services and Congress to improve domain awareness in order to detect, track, and defeat threats ranging from long-range ballistic missiles to small unmanned aerial systems. The defense of North America is an active endeavor that requires NORAD and NORTHCOM to campaign against all threats in all domains along all approaches. That effort requires seamless exchange of information with combatant commands, conventional and special operations forces, and the intelligence community, and the spectrum of interagency and international partners. The importance of collecting and disseminating information quickly cannot be overstated. I strongly support the department's work to advance the combined joint all-domain command and control concept as we seek to detect and track potential threats and share information as quickly as possible with analysts, operators, and decision makers around the world. Finally, upon taking command, I began a 90-day assessment to inform the Department, the Joint Force, and Congress on NORAD and NORTHCOM's ability to execute assigned tasks and make recommendations on where the command could or should do more. Once complete, I look forward to sharing my findings and updated vision for how NORAD and NORTHCOM will best execute the noble mission of homeland defense. The challenges facing our homelands are real, but there should be no doubt about NORAD and NORTHCOM's resolve to deter aggression and, if necessary, defeat threats to our nations and our citizens. Again, thank you for the opportunity to appear this morning. I look forward to working with the committee, and I'm happy to take your questions. 
Great. Thank you all. And I now recognize myself for questions. General Richardson and Gio, uh, you heard me outline and y'all talked about uh, China's infrastructure investments in South and throughout Latin America and the Caribbean. Are y'all concerned about them t taking those infrastructure investments and using them for military purposes? Uh, Chairman, yes, uh, we are worried about that. Uh, and uh, being able to flip uh, the, the state-owned enterprise, uh, critical infrastructure, what looks to be investment in the region, deep water ports, 5G, clean energy, uh, the safe city, smart city technology, and space uh, enabling infrastructure. General. Chairman, I uh, completely agree with General Richardson. Uh, from the Northcom, Northcom Homeland Defense uh, perspective, uh, it's something that I'm watching very closely in the 90-day uh, assessment and uh, look forward to sharing what I, uh, what I learned as far as the specifics of uh, what we can do to uh, address that threat more completely. Well, obviously, I, I'm concerned about it, and I'm, I'm particularly interested in both of y'all. What would you like to see Congress do to help you counter those malign influences in uh, the Caribbean and Latin America? So, Chairman, I would say that we've got to be on the field competing for the tenders and the contracts that come out from the, from the countries. And so uh, the countries put out the tenders, and our uh, Team USA, U.S. companies have got to be competing on that critical infrastructure. And so I've been, uh, over this past year, I've been partnering uh, U.S. Southern Command with, uh, more closely with the interagency to try and break down those barriers that are there. Also through the Inter-American Development Bank, Development and Finance Corporation, and all of the, all of the projects that come out of there. That's, those are big money projects that can compete uh, with Western solutions, Team USA solutions in support of the countries, and be a counter, an, an alternative uh, to the Chinese companies, state-owned enterprises that are competing on these contracts in the countries. General Gio, is there anything that you need from Congress to help you counter those influences? Chairman, thank you. Uh, first, we'll continue to cooperate with General Richardson and her command uh, as the seams between uh, Southcom and Northcom are seams that cannot be, uh, we need to make sure cannot be exploited. Uh, our approach to uh, partnering with Mexico is um, primarily through the mill-to-mill -mill arrangement, and with that, our Special Operations Command, uh, which we call SOC North, works side-by-side -side with uh, Mexican military uh, to build capacity, capability, and eventually interoperability. What I would appreciate is continued support for those efforts as we uh, st strengthen that relationship uh, on the south side of our border. Are those mill-to-mill -mill, um, authorizations that you have, the funding levels adequate at present? Chairman, at the present time, they are sufficient. General Richardson, are yours? So on the security cooperation, uh, not, not just yet, and the, uh, with the, uh, the, the, the bill, uh, defense bill that will be coming out for 24, uh, we hope to receive what we did last year, and that would, uh, that would go a long way to meeting our requirement if we were to receive the same thing as uh, we did in the previous year. Well, I appreciate your loyalty to the administration, but both of you are undercutting how much I think you need. I think the amount you received last year should be doubled at least this next year. Uh, with that, I will yield to uh, Mr. Panetta for any questions he may have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think obviously Russia has been occupied recently. However, they're still pretty active in the Arctic. And General Gio, I wanna focus on that area. Obviously with the expansion of NATO, creating more opportunities to secure the Arctic. It's becoming more critical that we leverage our special operations forces capabilities and ensure that our personnel are trained, readied, and equipped to project power. However, I've had some discussions recently with some special operations forces officers who talked about the difficulties that they've had, be it in resources that they have to operate in that area and the extremes that they have to deal with, but also that their training in Montana and Colorado no way compare to the actual environment of being in the Arctic. So and we can't address the tactical level difficulties without appropriately defining our mission in the Arctic. It remains unclear to many of our personnel what we mean when we say Arctic, which differs significantly by season. 
and what Arctic readiness is versus Arctic capable and how we should operate in an austere environment defined by both economic and military interests. So General, can you describe what our Arctic mission is and the department's efforts to better align that mission across services? Congressman Panetta, uh, our approach to the uh, Arctic Could you is, pull the microphone a little bit closer, please? Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, Chairman. Congressman, our approach to the Arctic is, is vital to our overall homeland defense because the Arctic is, comprises about 52 percent of the entire area of operation for uh, uh, NORAD and NORTHCOM's uh, areas. And uh, although we frequently talk about the Arctic in terms of Alaska, it's important to, to note that the uh, high north and then also the northeast uh, approach, which we call the 2 o'clock uh, position, is extremely important. What you uh, mentioned about the training of the forces uh, is exactly right. We have well-trained forces, but unfortunately they train often in the United States and not up in, in, in the Arctic, in Alaska, and therefore they need to have specific equipment, uh, gear, and kit to make sure that they can operate in that harsh environment. As we speak, our Special Operations Command is, is conducting two operations in uh, Alaska, Arctic Edge and ISEX, both of which are identifying the unique capabilities that we need to equip our forces to be able to fight there. And on the same, and uh, you pointed out the special operations on the other side, even with our air forces and, and army forces that operate very well in Alaska right now and are equipped for that, if uh, a, a conflict in the Pacific would cause them to push forward, I'm concerned that the forces back, that would backfill there may be well trained, but not specifically uh, in Arctic uh, techniques and then also with the gear necessary. So that is something that I will address uh, with the services to ensure that we have depth in our Arctic capability. Great. And, and you know, as you know well, uh, with the expansion of NATO, including Sweden and Finland, uh, how will using them as reliable partners, how do you think that's going to help us in our mission in the Arctic? Congressman, I think the, the, the uh, immediate benefit will be strengthening that 2 o'clock approach that I just mentioned. If I could use a quick example, for last week, uh, we had two times where Russian bear bombers flew along that uh, avenue for the first time in over two years, I, I should add, uh, approaching the Canadian and United States air defense identification zones off the northeast United States. As they approached, our uh, ability to share intelligence and radar picture with NATO partners to include Norway were vital for us to have the situation awareness as those bombers approached our area. Great. General Guillo, thank you for highlighting an area that I think uh, we have to focus on a little bit more. I appreciate that. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. We will now yield to the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. McCormick. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the witnesses, and also thank you for the two sergeant majors in the Marine Corps, because we know that uh, four-star generals and admirals are nowhere without their sergeant majors. Um, I want to address the fact that our four deployed military performs a critical task in defending us in this Western Hemisphere, which is often neglected in this conversation. I think uh, we cannot take this for granted, especially as the People's Republic of China and the pacing straight threat that we have increases its influence over Latin America. Honduras recently joined the Belt and Road Initiative, and Peru announced the construction of a massive Chinese financed deep water port. Now, by my estimates, I think China has over 50 deep water ports like this. We have about two. It puts this tremendous disadvantage in what's growing. Over the past 10 years, China has replaced the U.S. as Latin's top trading partner. This means that they basically have greater influence in the Western Hemisphere in some of the most populous areas in this region, to include Brazil, Peru, Colombia, Panama, Venezuela, Cuba, Honduras. The list keeps on growing. Uh, my concern is that as their influence continues to grow in the Latin America, how has it impacted Southcom's mission? How do we reestablish ourselves as good friends and the choice between two nations, one that I believe is very nefarious versus one that should be friendly as a global leader, especially in the Western Hemisphere. And General uh, Richardson, if you would uh, address this, please. 
Thank you, Congressman. So in my opening, I said, you know, the 28 like-minded democracies that we have in the region, we've got to partner better with them. And, um, and uh, close to 15 to 20 years receiving less than 50% uh, of my security cooperation requirement, as I mentioned last year's funding that we got in the uh, 8068 section was very, very helpful. But we, we can't just get one year of additional funding to meet the requirement. And I would say that our presence absolutely matters and our security cooperation program is my number one lever. Uh, in the Southcom AOR to partner with our militaries and the public security forces in the region and to provide uh, the counterbalance to uh, what the PRC is doing. And so, our, as I said, our presence absolutely matters. But when we're not there, and with this additional funding last year in the 8068 appropriation, we were able to get further into the southern cone, so the countries of, uh, of Chile, Argentina, Paraguay, Uruguay, uh, with exercises and more engagement other than just a visit every once a, uh, a year uh, has really made a huge difference in terms of the partnering. But we have to be there. We have to have good security cooperation programs. We have to have flexible authorities that as opportunities open, because they're only open for a short period of time, to allow Team USA to, to be able to be responsive to our partners. And I'd say we probably also have a neglect in AFRICOM too, for the same reasons. Uh, we just seem to look in different regions. We forget the places that we've in the past been very dominant, and now we're losing ground. Uh, Secretary Zimmerman, according to Customs and Border Patrol, so far this year we have encountered almost 19,000 Chinese nationals at the U.S.-Mexican border, a more than 50-fold increase since 2021. I might add we have a record number crossing the northern border from the Chinese nationals as well. We acknowledge the threat from the People's Republic of China, and it seems our poor southern border is in crisis already, which we've acknowledged. The American people are absolutely concerned as one of the number one issues in America. We know this is potential devastation to what could be terrorist activities, stealing information, smuggling things in. We have almost two million people that got away. We don't even know who. They are. We don't know how many of them are Chinese nationals as well. On top of that, 258 individuals on the terrorist list have crossed the southern border since the start of 2021. And oh, by the way, we have a record uh, number of Chinese coming in from all over the way, uh, whether it be by air or by sea or by across the borders. Uh, would you agree that the suspected terrorists and their potential PRC spies crossing the southern border are a national security threat? Uh Congressman, um, uh, you you speak of a very important challenge. I think um, uh, the crisis at the border includes a number of dimensions to include what we call extra hemispheric information uh, uh, immigration. Um, I, I think that any time we talk about um, uh, those actors that would be they uh, terrorists, um, be they. Uh, I hate to cut you off. I'm almost out of time. I just got to make my point. Go I know ahead. you agree. It's it's a it's a threat. Uh, I just want to point out that when we talk about the difference between undocumented versus documented, just Gentleman's to time has expired. Chair, not recognize the from Texas, Mr. Veazey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, and thank the, I want to thank the panel for being here today. And one of the things that is surprising to me uh, around the uh, issue that we're having at the border right now is people talk about it as if it's something that is, you know, brand, brand new or something that just happened. Uh, but General Richardson, I wanted to, to ask you, I'm sure that, that you have studied the history and remember when the Cali cartels and the Medellin cartels and Colombia was having issues dealing with far left uh, paramilitary organizations in that country, it created a great deal of instability um, um, from estimates that I've seen, depending on who you talk to, whether it's the Colombia government or from outside sources between 1985 and uh, 2002, perhaps, uh, anywhere from one to almost three million Colombians were displaced, some internally, but uh, some uh, sought refuge uh, outside of Colombia. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to talk with you about was Plan Colombia uh, that proved to be very effective uh, in helping uh, deal with a lot of that uh, regional uh, 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 destabilization that happened, a lot of the mass migration that happened by, by, by improving security measures, uh, economic development, uh, and other uh, areas that really helped finally bring and rein in some of the uh, issues from the Wild West days under those two cartels. And I was hoping that you could 
perhaps tell us what additional steps you think the U.S. can take, uh, including its military forces, to assist uh, other unstable countries uh, in the hemisphere in managing migration flows. Uh, and uh, but I'll, I'll let you answer that one first, and then I have a follow up to that. So there's a lot to unpack there, Congressman, because the uh, uh, the effects of Venezuela and uh, the seven and a half million uh, migrants that have uh, have poured out of uh, Venezuela as a result of the conditions there, and then coming into the region that is already economically impact for, in, impacted from COVID and still trying to dig out of the hole. And so uh, as you, uh, as some will, will go through the southern cone all the way down from, to the southern cone and back up uh, to only go through the very dangerous Darien jungle uh, and make that trek. And so uh, as we see the insecurity and the instability, families are on the move at unprecedented numbers. There used to be a lot of single movers, uh, but now there are families with young children trying to find a better life. And so in my opening, I talked about the potential of this region. A lot of talk about it 10 years ago to feed and fuel the world. That's the potential of this region. And, uh, and uh, if we can help this region uh, realize that potential uh, to slow down the migration, to have families feel secure and stable. But there's a lot of work to be done uh, in, in order to do that. Ever since last April, prior to the Title 42 expiration, uh, the United States signed a trilateral agreement with Colombia and Panama. That investment that you referenced, Plan Colombia, was huge, and our, our security relationship continues to be extremely strong with Colombia. And uh, the operations that both Colombia uh, with their military and Panama with their public security forces going after the criminal networks that are uh, trafficking the humans, but they're not just trafficking the humans, it's drugs and all of the other portfolio, illegal mining, illegal logging, counterfeit goods. And so as we continue with the migration, uh, a lot of the countries uh, in the uh, Southcom AOR have laws that, um, that migration is a human right. And so they don't try to, their laws don't uh, allow them to stop migration or slow the flow. So that's why our investment in the region with the safe mobility offices, the legal pathways. Uh, Administrator Power said it best, I think, that everybody knows how to get in touch with a smuggler to, to uh, get an illegal pathway to the United States, uh, but we have, to, we have to have that campaign that folks know how to legally get to the United States. Our policies matter in this respect, and, uh, and again, families are trying to realize the American dream, but how do we realize the American dream in the Americas with the potential to feed and fuel the world. Yeah. So I think economic investment as well as security investment is absolutely necessary. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank the gentleman chair. And I recognize the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Alford. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm honored to represent two distinguished military installations, Whiteman Air Force Base in Fort Leonard Wood in our district. As you know, the Chinese spy balloon that penetrated our airspace last year flew above Whiteman Air Force Base, the sole home to the B-2 stealth bomber and soon to be home to the B-21. Uh, General Guillaume, I want to start with you. The Chinese spy balloon last year highlighted disconcerting gaps in our all-domain surveillance and system of sensors that protect our homeland. What steps has North Command and NORAD taken to eliminate these gaps and mitigate risks? Congressman, I uh, outlined three uh, immediate steps that I have shown uh, uh, promise and uh, have been successful in identifying balloons that in the past we probably would not have seen. Uh, first and foremost, uh, my predecessor, General Van Herc, uh, directed the uh, radar sensitivities to be adjusted, which would allow uh, better detection of uh, low radar cross-section, slow-moving, uh, and high-altitude uh, objects although it introduces some clutter in the system because it's, uh, the, the system is receiving more, uh, it does allow us to detect uh, threats like the one that you just mentioned. Uh, second, when our operators see intermittent hits that in the past would be passed off to most usually weather or other phenomena that would cause an inconsistent hit, uh, they're now uh, continuing to track those uh, uh, more carefully and more consistently to ensure that it is not uh, a balloon or some other phenomena. And third is uh, 
better um, domain awareness between the uh, other uh, combatant commands. As we get uh, JADC2, the all-domain command and control system, the ability to share data from one combatant command to another instead of stopping at a, a, at a black line on a map that divides the uh, regions, now we can seamlessly share that information uh, electronically to increase our awareness further away from our shores. General Richardson, you've highlighted the attempts by the People's Republic of China in our hemisphere, the investments they've made. What is their end game in these investments? It's uh, to gain a foothold in all of the critical infrastructure. We've seen it. It's not new in uh, just South America and, uh, and Central America and the Caribbean. Uh, it's happened in Africa and in Europe as well. So but this is an intermediate step for what end? So I look at it as their way, uh, in this region, we worry about basing uh, for the PLA and the, as we have seen in other areas, but I look at the state-owned enterprises and the ability to be able to flip the use of that to possibly military application being sort of a basing strategy through critical infrastructure in the region. And if we were to become in a conflict with China, this would be very useful for and them. And that, that's my concern is exactly that. Ms. Zimmerman, have members of Hamas or Hezbollah crossed our southern border, and if so, how many? Congressman, I think I would have to uh, take that back to get you rough uh, numbers from DHS, um, since they have the lead on securing our nation's borders. Um, but uh, I'd be happy to talk to you in general about our But have they crossed? I, it, just without a number, can you give me any information on that? I can't speak to that. As has been said earlier, I know that there are members of the terrorist watch list who have uh, been detained while crossing the border. Back to uh, General Guillaume. What is the current nuclear threat in space from Russia? Congressman, the threat of uh, nuclear weapons in, in, in space, primarily from Russia, is, uh, is a constant and real concern. If I could, I'd like to address the specifics in a closed session. If there is an actual threat, should Americans know about it? Congressman, I think that it's important for all Americans to know of uh, the wide variety of threats that face the homeland in all domains. Thank you for that. I appreciate your service to our nation. With that, I yield back. Chair, I recognize Mr. Smith. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I apologize for being late, <coughs> late this morning. Believe it or not, I, I cut myself shaving, and it simply would not stop bleeding. Uh, and that's the reason I wasn't here. I wish I had a better story, but that's basically it. Um, I, don't, I don't want to cover a lot of ground that's already been covered, um, but I did have an opening statement talking about I mean, obviously, the number one issue that we're facing out of you know, the, both of your regions is the migration challenge coming up um, out of Latin America, how that's certainly pressuring our border, but it is also putting a lot of pressure on nations throughout um, your AOR. Uh, I know Colombia, Panama, Chile, amongst others, are, are facing that challenge and just the overall instability, and of course now instability coming out of Haiti as well. I think it's crucially important that we try to figure out some way to work with these countries to increase stability. You know, we can talk about the border and what should we do to secure it, what laws should we pass, but at the end of the day, as long as there are millions of people desperate to, to get out of where they're at and come here, you, there's no 100% fix to the problem in that situation. There just isn't. So getting greater stability in that region, understanding also that many of the migrants come from outside of your region, um, get into Latin America and work their way up is the number one thing. And also I think Mr. Alford's point about China, I think the answer to the question of what is their end game, China wants more influence in the world. And very specifically, they want more influence than us. They want to build partnerships and relationships wherever they can to undermine our ability to have influence in the world and put themselves in a better and stronger position. And we can see what that means. That it would put them in a better position to bully their way into, gosh, a half dozen countries where they claim territory, the Philippines, Indonesia, India, ironically, even Russia. Um, so that's really what we're fighting for is, is influence in the world um, and what they want to do. And I think it's really important that we build our relationships in Latin America to try and prevent that. And then on the North American side, again, I agree with Mr. Alford, tried to protect our airspace. Um, certainly, we've learned of some vulnerabilities in the last couple of years. I know, General Guillaume, you have addressed those, and I appreciate that. Uh, but those are the broad concerns. One question I would have um, is, 
you know, you mentioned the potential that exists in Latin America. I'd like um, both um, General Richardson and Ms. Zimmerman to address what can we be doing, what partners can we be working with to better realize that potential and reduce the chaos, reduce the drive that is pushing so many people out of so many countries and enforcing this migration? Ms. Zimmerman, why don't you go ahead and go first? Um, uh, thank you so much, Congressman, for that question. I think uh, you you speak to an important set of things, which is not simply what can we do uh, to respond in you know on on America's worst day if we find ourselves in conflict with China, but how can we actually build the relationships now? Because that speaks to the values that we share as democracies, um, and the department, uh, in conjunction with uh, other departments and agencies across uh, the U.S. government, is really working to reinforce those democratic values values is working to build strong defense partnerships. So for example, uh, the Secretary just attended the North American Defense Ministerial, uh, which is a trilateral conversation involving Canada and Mexico. Um, we have uh, the uh, Conference of Defense Ministers of the Americas, which will be coming up later this year. Um, so to ensure that the department represents those values in those forums. Um, but I think there's also work that we do uh, in building partner capacity, and I'll, I'll let General Richardson speak to that. Um, but I would also second uh, what, what General Richardson said earlier, which is that uh, some of the development development finance corporation efforts, uh, our other economic efforts, where we can nest those, um, where we can nest our activities in those common efforts, I think we can realize a lot of gains that um, uh, would otherwise working in silos in the government not be possible. Thank you, General. So, um, Congressman, the, uh, thank you for that, and thank you for the question. Uh, certainly, the the uh, funding that I received last year and the 8068 uh, funding, uh, additional funding on top of what I receive, uh, really helped. And it had flexible authorities to help us be responsive to our partner nations. And as you know, and as I've testified before, uh, and working with the DOD team, but also Department of State and the interagency to speed up our processes, inform military sales, access defense articles, and not take years to deliver a capability because these, our partner nations are, uh, these heads of state are in the seat generally one term of four years, and they're working on a stopwatch, not a calendar. They need uh, results within months, not years. And so um, that's what has led me to also uh, partner with Department of Commerce, Department of Treasury, uh, the American Chamber of Commerce, because our economic security is really, really important here. So when you're talking about the, the realization of feeding and the fuel in the world, when half the soybean for the globe comes from this region, 30% of the corn and the, and the uh, sugar comes from this region for the globe. Uh, you've got the Amazon, you've got 31% of the world's fresh water, you've got light sweet crude, heavy crude, you've got gold, copper, rare earth elements, the lithium triangle, 60% of the world's lithium is in this region. Uh, the potential is there, so how do we help with the economic investment? We have a lot of foreign direct investment from the United States already, but our U.S. companies in the region uh, we need to brand and, and start bragging about what Team USA does uh, for the countries already. And then we have to help streamline the, uh, how our uh, companies, and if there are barriers to competing on the tenders for critical infrastructure in South America, Central America, and the Caribbean. Uh, and, and that is part of that partnership that we've been doing. National security rests on uh, economic security. Yeah. And just one comment, one, one final, final question. I think the security piece of this is crucial, and I know it's something that Congress writ large is wrestling with right now. You know, we, we have concerns when we sell arms or security um, equipment to other nations, what do they do with them? And those concerns are legitimate. But I hope everyone understands that every nation tries to figure out some way to provide for their own security. Okay, there is no nation out there that just simply lays down their arms and hopes for the best. Okay, they try to maintain security and that's never easy and it's always a very difficult balance. A partnership with these other countries, part of it is helping them provide that security. And our slow walking of arms sales is undermining our relationships throughout the world and opening the door wide for China and Russia. 
It is not like these nations are not going to get weapons if we stop selling them to them. They're just going to build different relationships. We've certainly seen that in the Middle East, and I hope we're mindful of the trade-off. Final question is our relationships in Latin America. You know, one of the big things, Russia and China have an incredibly aggressive messaging machine. They are out there 24-7 denigrating us, basically. It's a, it's a massive worldwide negative campaign um, that people here domestically pick up for a variety of different reasons. And one of the things they play off of is historical concerns about what the U.S. has done in a bunch of places, but particularly in Latin America. So when you're working with Brazil and Argentina and Chile, how do you push back against that negative campaign? Because it does seem to be having an effect. I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong on that point, but I think it, is, it has hurt our relationships with a number of countries in Latin America, the battle with Cuba, the battle with Nicaragua, what's going on with Venezuela. How can we better burnish our own image so that we can have a better chance at building the partnerships we need to build? Well, I would, I would say, Congressman, thank you for that question, because the, uh, we've got to be trusted partners, and uh, we have, a, we have uh, the uh, American Partnership for Economic Prosperity, APEP, which is a uh, program from the Summit of the Americas. And APEP hosted uh, at the White House in early November uh, 11 Latin, America, uh, Latin American heads of state that came. And for a week, uh, they uh, discussed the challenges in the region, but then also uh, rolled out the programs of economic help in terms of in modern ports, clean energy, and digital technology. And billions of dollars of programs and efforts of infusement of economic investment into the region through the Inter-American Development Bank and also through uh, Developmental Finance Corporation. And so uh, with that, there are some shares, 75 million in shares that are coming up for vote this month that I would recommend that as we had this APEP in November and, and hosted these leaders at the White House, that we have got to, uh, we have got to um, recommend that we purchase those shares from the United States so we don't give our adversaries an opportunity to purchase them uh, as part of the investment that we rolled out in the November timeframe. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair, I recognize the gentlelady from Virginia, Ms. Kiggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you uh, for our guests for being with us today. Just a comment about uh, the security potential that we have in Central and South America, and I think just prioritizing our funding so that we can put more, our money where our mouth is. The defense budget is always inadequate, and uh, and just making sure that we are again, prioritizing that funding because it is so important. I wanted to speak and ask a little bit about Cuba. In my district, I represent Virginia's second congressional district, so we have Naval Air Station Oceana there. And they've recently moved their Strike Fighter Advanced Readiness Program, or SFARP exercises, back home to Virginia Beach uh, because they are worried about activity in Cuba from the Chinese. And so could you speak a little bit just about what concerns you have about Chinese activity in Cuba and what approaches we're taking to fortify the security encounter of our adversaries in this region? So thank you, Congresswoman. And the, uh, certainly that concern being so close to the homeland uh, is, is very concerning. Uh, the U.S. interagency is working very hard to uh, counter that effort, and, um, and I can talk to more about that in the, in the classified session afterwards. Great, thank you. And then I also want to talk about Haiti a little bit just because of the unrest and maybe Ms. Emmerman, you can answer the question just with the recent news about the Prime Minister stepping down and understanding that we've increased our, uh, our aid, $300 million in addition to $33 million in humanitarian assistance going to that region. And, uh, and then talks of sending perhaps military as well. So uh, can you just speak to what is going on there? Is there a possibility of us sending our troops to that region? Um, absolutely. I'm, I'm happy to speak to that, Congresswoman. Um, so the situation in Haiti remains obviously very tense, um, and the U.S. is participating in uh, both um, uh, uh, its own efforts and also uh, efforts in support of uh, CARICOM and other allies um, with respect to Haiti. So uh, in terms of a troop commitment of U.S. troops, um, we are talking there only about security augmentation for our embassy in Port-au-Prince. Um, there isn't discussion of uh, sending in our military, um, but we are in support of uh, the MSS, the Multinational Security Support Mission 
mission for Haiti. Uh, this is the Kenyan-led mission uh, to train and support the Haitian National Police. Uh, so there, the department has increased its funding from 100 million to 200 million in order to better support um, uh, the logistics and sustainment aspects of that mission in order to get the mission fielded as soon as we can. Thank you. And then also briefly, we see China adopting some of our tactics that we've developed, that we use to develop alliances with exercise, military exercises specifically with, with some of those 28 democracy countries that, that you mentioned. And that's kind of been how the United States has developed our, our friendships and we have done military exercises together uh, so that we understand each other's capabilities, that we're there for each other if needed. So we see China kind of adopting that and, uh, and now doing their own types of exercises. Can, can you speak to where that is happening? Are those 28 democracies democracies, are they steadfast in their relationship with us or are they turning around and then participating in exercises with potential adversaries of ours? I would uh, say, Congresswoman, the, uh, in terms of, you're absolutely right, the, the, the PRC is utilizing our playbook um, as well, and not just in exercises, but key later engagements and things like that. So they're upping the ranks of the PLA that are now showing up to the, uh, to the exercises and the Marines. Uh, and, um, and I would say that uh, the way to, uh, when I say our presence absolutely matters, it really does. And, uh, and us being able to have an exercise, several years ago my exercise funding to get me down into the Southern Cone, Southcom and all of our components uh, was reinstalled with the additional funding last year. And so happy to say that we're, we're able to be there. But uh, I would ask for that continued funding. I don't need to outspend the PRC to outcompete them. We just need to be there. We got to be there. And I would say on the economic side of the house, if we're not there from Team USA, mm -hmm. then uh, and responsive when opportunities open up and uh, they need help. If we can't help them, then they're going to look to to whoever has uh, the cash or the loans or things like that in order to uh, fund what they need. Again, for the presidents that are in the seat for a, a very short term of four years. So those the 28 democracies that you talk about that that are the friendly countries are they are they pretty steadfast though in those relationships? Are they are they questioning our uh, alliances just based off kind of what they're seeing with Russia and Ukraine and, and our ability to uh, to provide aid to allies throughout the world? Is it, is it having an impact in, in your... General Lee's time's expired. Chair, I recognize the General Lee from the great state of Alabama. Ms. Sewell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank our witnesses uh, for being here today. And as the emerging threats uh, environment facing the United States become increasingly complex, I really do appreciate your dedication to protecting our homeland, our citizens, and our troops. Um, General Guillo. Is that right? General Guillo. I first want to discuss hypersonic weapons, uh, which have become a key component for both Russia and China. Hypersonics, high speed, uh, low trajectory, and maneuvering capabilities pose a major challenge to our ability to identify and warn of inbound threats. With your priority of, de of um, detecting classifying and tracking potential threats to the homeland, are we providing enough resources for reactive threat representation from hypersonics? Congresswoman, I, I share your assessment on hypersonics. I think that they are probably the most technologically challenging threat that we're facing, as well as the most destabilizing because of where they operate between uh, established norms and, and, and weapons, specifically for uh, NORAD and NORTHCOM, because both commands have a role with uh, hypersonics. Uh, I'm comfortable with the trajectory that we're on to, to build systems that can detect and track. We have some capability today, uh, but as the threat advances, we need to advance. And so staying uh, on track with our over-the-horizon radar and some space-based systems, which will give us uh, hypersonic detect and track capability, is essential. Uh, here in the coming years. So what about uh, next generation um, technology with respect to hypersonics? Do you feel like we have enough um, resources around that? Because I really don't think we do. I understand that we don't have to out um, spin them, but we do have to be protective and, 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 and show foresight. And so talk to me a little bit about that. Congresswoman, I agree. We need to uh, double the efforts in like I said, we can detect what we have today, but that's not where our adversaries will be in just a, a couple of short years. 
uh, and that's on the defensive part. <clears throat> Obviously, uh, not directly my realm, but then to, to deter keeping pace on the offensive side is, is important, and I know that my fellow combatant commanders are looking at that as well. And I've also had some uh, very good discussions with the Missile Defense Agency, MDA, about uh, some of the uh, systems that they're developing. Um, both in the future as well as adapting current systems today to be able to defeat hypersonics. Just want to make um, sure that you know that those. there are those of us who are really quite concerned about that and would um, welcome the opportunity to talk further about it. Ms. Uh, Zimmerman, at your testimony, you discussed the impact uh, climate change has on our military readiness. Uh, you highlight the Global Water Security Center at the University of Alabama, which utilizes DOD funding to provide education, training, and research-related uh, water, food, energy, and natural disasters. Can you discuss how the um, Global Water Center uh, assessments help combatant commands, uh, strategic planning, and contribute to our national security? Thank you very much. I, I think in terms of some of those specifics, uh, I'd like to get back to you in a little bit more detail. But I will say that our ability to get on the same page as a department and as a government in our analysis, our understanding of the problem is what is right now allowing us to begin to take action with the goal uh, for the department of really ensuring uh, seamless operations when we need them, where we need them, regardless of the impact of climate change and extreme weather. Great. Um, General Richardson, we continue to see our adversaries target our partners in South America from China's Belt and Road Initiative to Russia's disinformation. With China emerging as South America's top trading partner, how can we use our trade uh, initiatives like the Americas uh, Partnership uh, for Economic Prosperity to deter China? Uh, I would say that the uh, we have to be um, what we said that we're going to do. We've got to follow through with that and do what we said we we're going to do. And uh, and I think that that is a huge investment in the region. Eleven presidents from this region out of the 31 that came here to Washington D.C. That shows you. Uh, I mean, that's a. Uh, I look at that as just a foot in the door to expand that. I mean, what a great first effort. And I'm so excited about this program. The attention, the investment, uh, it's huge for, for Team USA and Team Democracy. And so if we can just make that even bigger and better, uh, that's what we need to do. Thank you. I yield back the balance. <laughs> General, it's time to expire. Chair, I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Latrell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank everybody for coming today and thank everybody for your service, everyone. In, in uniform and, and our veterans, thank you, absolutely thank you for what you do to keep our families safe. Uh, Mr. Guillo, this is your first time in front of Congress. I think you missed an absolute great opportunity. Ms. Richardson, you failed on that one too. If the chairman of HASC says, I think your budget should be doubled, your immediate response is you will have it by the end of the day. Tracking? Okay, good, let's, let's move on. Uh, my colleague from Alabama hit it on the head with hypersonics. That's very forward-leaning, and that's, I think that's a very um, high-risk high profile that we need to be addressing. But my, other, my concern, besides that, is, is cyber. So I was, I was hoping, General Richardson and General Gill, can you, can, you, can you give me a, a kind of a high-level briefing on where we stand with cyber risk, cyber threat in both of your and, uh, AORs, and the advances in AI that we're in placing, and how we function and the functionality with our partners, because their footprint is far inferior to ours. It is, and the uh, 14 major attacks on government networks in 10 countries over this past year. We can't respond fast enough and help our partners with training. Uh, the uh, additional funding I received last year helps with the Security Cooperation Initiative, uh, SSCI for cyber. But our, uh, our authorities in institutional capacity building, triple three, are not responsive enough. So I would say, what help does, uh, do, do the COCOMs need help with? Is that flexible funding with triple three to help our partners? So when these opportunities, they, they're crises, 
but they're also opportunities to help our partners. And so they, they, that's what they rely on us for, being fast and being quick to uh, help them. And so I, I, I would say that that would be what we would need help with. Are we I in would, the process of line iting those exact things? I mean, we're going to need absolutely. to present that to us so we know details. Yes, and in our security cooperation initiatives for cyber, we're laying that out. And I, I have what's called a JCAT, a Joint Cyber Assessment Team from Southcom. It's like a quick reaction force to help our partners and then do the institutional capacity building of training with them on cyber. But we need to, we need to do more on cyber because they're... The level of technology um, is, uh, and how quick technology is, uh, is happening, they cannot keep up with it. And yes, so that's why they, they need our assistance with that. Well, we're more than willing to assist you with that, especially given the advancements in, in, in cyber risk and cyber threat. Thank you, Congressman. Yes, ma'am. General. Congressman, first, uh, thanks. Message received on the funding. Solid. Right. Uh, uh, as far as cyberspace, just with all the threats that we face uh, in the homeland in all domains, the most persistent and present threat that we face is the cyber threat. Uh, we see attacks every day on or attempts to attack our networks every day on both the, uh, we have four networks in Northern Command that we use to, you know, conduct our mission that we protect and then also across the DOD network that we uh, work in uh, primarily with Cyber Command to make sure we're defending, as well as with CISA and the FBI on the defense critical infrastructure. Uh, so uh, I share your concern on that. Uh, that is certainly the most persistent and uh, um, challenging threat that, that we face. Uh, have confidence in our detect, but you don't know what you don't know. And then so uh, continued emphasis on this is something that you'll see from NORA and NORTHCOM. Perfect. It, th this is a language not very many people speak. And it seems as if as these attacks happen daily, every half second, they are, are so repetitive. I don't want it to be siloed in a way that the, the Armageddon happens and like, well, we've been, this has been happening for years. We just, we didn't know how to, to number one, address that up and out of the organization or combat it. So it, I'm asking you to share with us as best you can where we stand, where we need to move, how we need to flex left, right of center in order to not become victims in this space. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Jim Hills back, Chair, and I recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Davis. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, and to our witnesses today. I've actually taken my second trip while um, serving in the 118th Congress to the southern border. I visited most recently the Del Rio sector um, to witness the evolving crisis firsthand. Um, while there, uh, we had the opportunity to meet with those who are working on the front line. Um, so we Definitely appreciate the service and all the work that's taken place that's gone into it so far. Ms. Zimmerman, <clears throat> while in Eagle Pass, we learned there have been more than 120,000 known gotaways um, so far, fiscal year 2024. Um, how do you compare the threat posed by these individuals, some of whom are um, on the terror watch list, um, with those who are actually unknown? I, I couldn't understand your last question. Yeah, I said, how do we compare those to those who are unknown? To those who are unknown? Yes. Um, uh, well, Congressman, I think, uh, you know, the, the work that we're doing, not just in Eagle Pass, but in other places in support of uh, the Department of Homeland Security and our CBP colleagues, is uh, intended to minimize that number of known gotaways. Um, we do a lot of detection and monitoring in support of CBP, um, which helps to ensure that CBP can respond uh, where they need to, when they need to. In terms of uh, those who might be uh, affiliated with terrorist criminal organizations, et cetera, uh, I think it's a, a small number relative to the, the other gotaways. Um, but of course, uh, as, as General Gio said, with respect to cyber, we can't know what we, what we don't know. Okay. Is it safe to say if we know that what we don't know, that there are some unknowns, I mean, is it only an, an assumption that there are likely some who may have been on a terror watch that could have been unknown or identified as unknown? Uh, 
Congressman, I think this is really a question for the Department of Homeland Security, uh, which, which leads those efforts. Okay, thank you. Um, moving on then, uh, Ms. Zimmerman and General Guillo, um, when we talk then in terms of uh, transnational criminal organizations uh, like uh, the drug cartels, um, my question is how can we better predict than the next epicenter of the crisis um, based on resources that may be at our hands. Congressman, uh, with regard to uh, countering the TCOs, uh, NORAD has some very uh, specific guidance from the department on how we can assist. And the way we present that is through uh, partnering with various lead federal agencies in the area of intel support, more particularly uh, by targeting uh, the, the network using some of the techniques that uh, Special Operations Command and Central Command have used effectively overseas uh, with terrorist networks, using some of those same techniques uh, to, to help uh, illuminate on the, on the cartels. And so uh, through our uh, JTF North, that's where we present that capability to the interagency. It's hard to add to that. I think that was a very comprehensive answer. But uh, broadly speaking, we work in conjunction with other departments and agencies, making sure that um, we're breaking down those silos. Uh, I, I was also on the border just, uh, I think, the week before last, uh, speaking with um, our, our colleagues from JTF North and hearing from them uh, that our cooperation with CBP and, and, by extension, the Border Patrol, I think is is... Uh, more thorough and deeper than it has been in, in many years. Okay. And um, General um, Geo, your men and women who've augmented um, in terms of the Department of Homeland Security for, I believe, 18 years now, um, it's my understanding that uh, this was never intended to be an enduring mission as it's become. Um, can you describe the impact that it has on uh, those who continue to serve? Congressman, uh, uh, while it hasn't uh, been attended to be an enduring mission, uh, we recognize that uh, our partners need help and the department has uh, tasked NORTHCOM to, to do that. The readiness that you alluded to is a, is a very big concern of, of mine. We operate in three primary areas. You know, in the aviation, I think that we can maintain our readiness for other worldwide uh, missions uh, in the course of the support missions. But some of the other ones, the logistical support, uh, it, and the detection and monitoring require us to take them off the line and conduct other training so they can uh, keep their worldwide readiness while they're conducting the Southwest Border Mission. And that's something that I and JTF North track very closely. Thank you. Yield back, Mr. Chair. Thank you, General Chair. Now I recognize the General from Alabama, Mr. Strong. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank each of you for being here today. Um, General uh, Geo, the next generation interceptor will play a critical role in U.S. Northern Command uh, mission and homeland defense. Your predecessor, General Van Herc, told the Senate Armed Services Committee on March 20, uh, of 2022 that the United States needs to deploy the next generation interceptor, NGI, by 2028 or sooner to keep pace with our adversaries. What is your assessment of the current NGI schedule given the evolving uh, threat picture? Congressman, I agree with General Van Herc's assessment. Uh, it's one of the first things I looked at upon taking command. Uh, I still uh, feel that 2028 is the, uh, the, the point where if we have not fielded this system by then, that we run the risk of falling behind the advances of competitors, most, most notably North Korea. But at this time, I feel that uh, we have the capability to defeat that threat but we must stay on time with NGI in order to preserve that capability. Thank you. Just to confirm, you agree that fielding the NGI as soon as possible uh, is critical for defense of the homeland? Congressman, I absolutely agree with that. Thank you. If, uh, if NGI, uh, the NGI program failed like its predecessor, uh, what uh, would that mean for the homeland defense uh, system, missile defense system? Congressman, I'll go into details in the closed session, but it would mean that we are not keeping pace with the rogue nations, in particular North Korea. That would be a very bad thing, correct? It would be a very bad thing. Okay. So. As we have seen, um, uh, others now canceled uh, portions of the ground-based mid-course defense system. Maintaining competition as long as possible is critical. The acquisition uh, strategy for NGI is the gold standard, and uh, the plan has always been to carry two teams through at least 
critical design review. Uh, this is why I'm extremely concerned by reports that the department is now officially planning to conduct an early down select for NGI. NGI is the future of Homeland Missile Defense, and we don't have another capability in the pipeline if these programs fail. Are you concerned with the amount of risk that hasty uh, cost-cut measures would add? Congressman, I'm, I'm concerned with anything that would give us a less than capable uh, NGI system. I'll defer to the department and MDA on the specifics of the uh, contracting measure. Uh, but I do have uh, frequent and, and thorough discussions with MDA to ensure that the operational requirements that were established by NORTHCOM are being met. Thank you. I understand that you're not going to go against your boss, but would you say that the next generation in, uh, interceptor is a no-fail mission? Congressman, I believe NGI is a no-fail mission. Then why would we put all our eggs in one basket earlier than planned? Congressman, to the specifics of the, of the contract and the procurement, I, I have to defer to the MDA experts. Again, I'm very concerned by the proposed major change to policy for NGI, and I look forward to continuing discussions with the DOD on how it intends to mitigate the extreme risk of an early down select. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank the uh, gentleman. Chair, now I recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Deluzio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. Uh, you've highlighted examples today in your testimony and in your written testimony of how the Chinese Communist Party is increasing infrastructure investments in the Western Hemisphere. Certainly concerning. Uh, what also concerns me, though, is their access to our own infrastructure here in this country. Uh, our maritime ports, for example, Wall Street Journal highlighted just last week Nearly 80% of our ship-to-shore cranes are Chinese-built, many containing unexplained covert communications capabilities and equipment. I think the vulnerabilities there are, are obvious. Uh, I was happy to see uh, last year's NDAA, Section 7405, require an assessment of the threat posed by these cranes. Uh, I support H.R. 3169, Mr. Jimenez and Garamendi and others, as well, uh, the Port Crane Security and Inspection Act. So, General Gill, I'll start with you. Given that much of our port infrastructure is privately owned and we see these vulnerabilities in public reporting, what is NORTHCOM's responsibility here uh, and where is private or corporate responsibility lie as well? Congressman, primarily the uh, defense of the, the ports is a, uh, is, is a private matter. Uh, however, uh, in, uh, in particular in the cyber realm, NORTHCOM has a, a very vested interest in, in it because of our uh, defense of critical infrastructure role. In particular, this is where uh, we, on, on behalf of uh, requested uh, support from the private companies, uh, if, if they request help in the cyber in cooperation with CISA and uh, Cyber Command, any uh, support given to them uh, with cyber defense from DOD would be uh, synchronized and presented through NORTHCOM. Do our adversaries care if our infrastructure is owned by a private or a public entity? Well, I, I don't believe so. I think they, uh, Congressman, I think they worry about their own interest and, and, and not ours. All right. Uh, related to that, and my district and, and many others saw nation state actors attack critical infrastructure, the Aliquippa Water Authority in Western Pennsylvania. My district experienced an attack. I'm not alone in that. Uh, how do you see those? vulnerabilities to our critical infrastructure, not just threatening our way of life, our prosperity, but undermining defense? Congressman, the way I see it undermining defense is it could potentially, uh, you mentioned water, the ports, electricity, any number of rail, any number of those systems that aren't considered to be military or, or de uh, defense department yeah. actually are very important to us as we look to project forces overseas. We would use all those capabilities to support combatant commands around the world. So that's why in my homeland defense uh, responsibilities, I take a special interest in that. Thank you. And Ms. Zimmer, I'm going to come to you. I'll just say this. I mean, you outlined the Homeland Defense Policy Guidance in your testimony. Uh, a quote here there must be a quote, focus on defending defense critical infrastructure against attacks in all domains and build resiliency and redundancy, end quote. And the general went to it. There are pieces of non-defense critical infrastructure that defense department military facilities rely on. Can you tell me more about that and 
how you worry about those vulnerabilities. Congressman, I'd be glad to. Um, this is a major effort that the Department is undertaking now in support of the resilience of defense critical infrastructure. And we recognize that a large part of uh, the infrastructure on which the Department of Defense relies is not defense owned. Some of it is federal infrastructure owned by federal partners and some of it is in the private sector. Um, the Department of Defense is the sector risk management agency for defense critical infrastructure. There are SRMAs for all of the varieties of critical infrastructure. We come together in uh, the Federal Senior Leader Council, uh, which is managed by CISA, to talk about cyber threats and we talk about those in a cross forum uh, where we're able to talk with those agencies about uh, the infrastructure on which the Department of Defense depends. And so we're able to make decisions, we're able to make sure that the risk management constructs uh, that those agencies are pursuing accommodate the needs of the Defense Department. But in addition to that, we're making efforts to reach out to our federal, state, local, tribal, and territorial, and private sector defense industrial based partners. So we've recently uh, reformed some of our guidance about how we're able to talk about these issues in order to allow us to have uh, classified conversations and unclassified conversations in a much more fulsome way with those partners so that they can understand where our dependencies are. We're also working uh, in conjunction with uh, uh, CISA, some of our FEMA colleagues, uh, to support the better mapping of critical infrastructure in order to draw out what those dependencies look like. Thank you. And I'll, I'll just close with the question I asked to General Guillaume. Do, do you think our adversaries care if the thing they are targeting is defense, civilian, private? Uh, does it matter to them? I think they absolutely do not. I think they will target the areas that are weakest, and we have to be prepared. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Chair, I recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Laloda. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I represent a district in New York, and I want to start by offering uh, my condolences to the families of two New York National Guardsmen, Chief Warrant Officers Casey Frankowski and, um, and John Gracia, who were killed in the recent helicopter crash on our southern border. Their services and sacrifices to our great nation cannot be forgotten. Uh, Generals, uh, Ms. Zimmerman, uh, we have a problem in America's southern border uh, and crises at many of America's cities and states. Uh, and I want to use my time to address the impact of your areas of operations, Southcom especially, uh, General Richardson, um, have on our security at America's southern border and in states like New York. Uh, just a few years ago, MS-13, with many routes in El Salvador, had a massive and destructive presence on Long Island, where I represent. Uh, the motto of MS-13, for folks at home who may not know, is kill, rape, and control. Uh, and while MS-13 was largely eradicated on Long Island several years ago, credit to a good partnership between the federal government and local law enforcement. I am concerned about the resurgence of MS-13 or a group like it. Uh, and I'm concerned because there's two policy choices going on that are exacerbating the flow of migrants across the southern border and to states like mine. Those policies are the administration paroling millions of non-citizens into the United States and New York City's migrant crisis, which is exacerbated by their sanctuary policies. Uh, in light of these concerns, I'm eager to explore how we uh, can bolster our defenses and ensure that Long Island continues to contribute effectively to our national defense architecture. General Richardson, um, the administration states they're properly vetting all the migrants who come to the United States before paroling them in the United States. Yet critics contend that the proper vetting would entail much more. It would entail full cooperation from the migrant's home country, an awareness of that home country and what that individual's background is, cooperation between that host nation's law enforcement and intelligence services. Uh, General, in your capacity as SOUTHCOM commander, is it safe to say that you've become familiar with the El Salvador military? Uh, yes, I am familiar with the El Salvador military. Uh, are you familiar with the El Salvador government? Uh, no, Congressman. Uh, how about some of the local police departments? No, Congressman. Okay. Given your expertise with the military component, um, can you tell us um, how the intelligence apparatus in countries like El Salvador compares to the United States? Uh, it's definitely not as robust, Congressman. Scale of one to ten. If the United States is the ten standard, where would you put nations in your AOR? Uh, in terms of the intelligence capacity? Yep. I would say... Um, they have the advantage of uh, having home turf advantage, uh, but I would say uh, inside their country, it would be a 10. 
And then uh, as we encourage our partners to work together, cross their borders uh, to share information, because all of them are experiencing some, uh, some form of all of the threats that I've talked about. And so uh, them working together, together better, not just within their own borders, binational operations that we see taking place between Colombia and Ecuador, uh, the work that Colombia and Panama is doing cross-border on migration cut you off. I apologize, as well. General. So, so inside the home country, you're saying they have a decent awareness. I appreciate that. Um, you also said that you don't, there's no fault of your own. Your command doesn't necessarily have a relationship with the government there or law enforcement, I understand as well. Uh, what would you say with respect to the intelligence sharing from countries like El Salvador to the United States? Is that a mutual thing? Is it one way? Is it minimal? How would you characterize the intelligence sharing between us and El Salvador? I would say that the work that, uh, that the ambassador has done on the ground, uh, our U.S. ambassador to El Salvador, and the work that we have and the relationships that we have with El Salvador, we have a robust relationship, uh, military to military. And so the sharing of information, I think, uh, from El Salvador with the United States is good in that respect. But you don't, are, are you aware of any relationships either State Department or other U.S. officials have with some of those more national or local law enforcement entities? Uh, you'd have to speak to them, Congressman. Okay. Um, focusing on drug trafficking, narcotics, uh, transitional uh, organizations like MS-13, um, what sort of intelligence have you shared in this setting, uh, I understand, uh, with countries like El Salvador with respect to entities like MS-13 and drug trafficking? I have relied on the uh, State Department and the U.S. Ambassador in terms of the intelligence sharing uh, that they would do with the country of El Salvador. Thank you. Appreciate your service. My time has expired. I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. Chair, now I recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to share my sense of the situation with respect to fentanyl production in Mexico, and if I'm wrong, I'd like you to correct me. My understanding is that there are two cartels that are producing the vast majority of the fentanyl that comes into the United States, that we know where these cartels are, that the Mexican government, more specifically the president of Mexico, has been very reluctant to acknowledge this problem, let alone respond to this problem, and specifically has been very reluctant to enter into any kind of military partnership with us, that we could be much more effective and helpful than we are being allowed to be by the Mexican government. Is any of that wrong? That's my understanding. Feel free to correct me. Congressman, I, uh, I, I can't refute anything that you said. I would point out that uh, as part of the 90-day assessment that I'm undergoing, uh, I am looking uh, very closely at the operational environment, uh, specifically with uh, Mexico and, and uh, how we address that transnational uh, uh, criminal organizations. And uh, at the conclusion of this, I will brief the uh, secretary on my findings, and then I'll be happy to share uh, after that uh, with this body. My sense is that part of... Uh one of the success stories that we have to tell with the introduction of drugs and combating cartels is with Venezuela, because many years ago, the Venezuelan government accepted our help, accepted our military assistance with respect to running offense on the cartels. Jenna Richardson, am I right in my understanding of that, that we were able to be very helpful there? Um, so the... Uh General Guillo has Mexico and his AOR in terms of uh, with the cartels and, and, uh, and I would say with the transnational criminal organizations in my region uh, and the insecurity and the instability that they continue to create and, uh, and their uh, portfolio has diversified and they become more powerful. As I was saying uh, before this, the, the, our countries working together to try and eliminate those threats and share the information on those, those threats that are in the South America, Central American region is uh, extremely important. I think what I'm driving at is I think there's a, there are good examples of times in which other countries have entered into military partnership with us in order to run offense on cartels. And it feels like that would be an appropriate partnership right now with Mexico. And the president of Mexico is resisting this. 
for reasons that I'm sure none of us fully understand. And at the conclusion of your 90-day assessment, this is going to be a point of extreme interest for a lot of people. Um, because I have people who are dying every day in my state, every single day. And the sense is when we hear statements from the Mexican president like, this is not a problem, this does not exist as a problem, we know that's not true. And it colors all of our thinking about, well, what, what does the solution to the problem really look like? Can we solve the problem when the president of Mexico refuses to acknowledge its existence, let alone refuses to accept our assistance in dealing with this, as other nations have to their benefit in the past? Um, can you describe, and I know you're still within an assessment, the current scope of our assistance to Mexico with respect to running offense on cartels? What's it look like right now, such as you can? Congressman, uh, NORTHCOM is, is, is authorized to uh, uh, participate in the counter TCO by providing intelligence support. Uh, we run the uh, Info Analysis Center in Mexico City, where we uh, coordinate with the lead federal agencies for the uh, U.S., as well as cooperate with General Richardson's uh, Giada South uh, for a full um, uh, approach of south of our border to include into uh, Southern Command's uh, AOR. So uh, by target, uh, in that center, we target the, um, the network. We, we assist with targeting the network with our intel uh, specialists and then distribute the information to the interagency, which- What I hear you saying is purely intel at this point, nothing tactical. Is that th rough that is, the assessment? That is correct. Thank you. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair, and I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Fallon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, I, when I saw the, the to topic of the hearing a few days back, you know, security challenges of North America, South America, I immediately, I'll admit, I immediately thought about Venezuela. I want to take my five minutes to ask about Venezuela and, and Cuba and the uh, MS-13, like my colleague from New York did, or uh, the Mexican drug cartels. And then it dawned on me uh, that I did pay attention in elementary school, and America is part of North America. So why aren't we talking more about focusing my five minutes on securing our own border? And uh, what I wanted to do is ask uh, General Guillo, do you think that if you had... Are, I would, th I, I, I assume we all agree that border security is a national security issue. Just, do we, do we agree on that, General Guillaume? Congressman, I do agree. Yeah, okay, I don't think that's a, a, a real reach. And what concerns me is when I look back at prior administrations, and the two prior administrations before the current one, at this juncture in their administrations, they had about 1.7 million illegal border crossings. Unfortunately, that's now, depending on exactly what stat use, it's hovering around 8 million. Uh, would you agree that that is a, a troubling trend? Congressman, uh, the role of NORTHCOM on the border is to support the uh, Department of Homeland Security and the Customs and Border Protection. In, uh, in support roles that, that don't uh, relate to the law enforcement or the- Sure, uh, but General, I count eight stars on your shoulders. Do you think that that's a, a troubling trend? Would you rather, the, the, the fewer illegal crossings we have, is that, would that, would you agree that that's better? The fewer, the better? Yes, I would agree okay. with that. Uh, because we don't know who a lot of these folks are. In, in the prior administration, we had a couple of years where we had three, three individuals on the terrorist watch list that were apprehended. And then this past fiscal year, I believe it was 169. That is a, an alarming difference. Would you not agree? Congressman, I, I agree uh, that, that any threats that come into the U.S. Uh, would be a concern to me as the NORTHCOM commander. So with, um, let's talk about the Mexican drug cartels. A clear and present danger to the United States? Would you agree with that statement? Congressman, I would, I, would, I would say that it's certainly a national challenge and a national concern. So I'd say you would, would agree with that, that the cartels are a danger to the United States. The Mexican drug the cartels car present a Cartel danger activity to the does pose a, a danger to the United States. Okay, so we don't want to embolden them. We'd like to have them weakened because the, more, uh, the stronger they get, the more they endanger American citizens. Would that be accurate? It's not a trick question, General. Well... 
but it's really. Off. I mean, all right. Well, we've got General Richardson. Do you th do you think that that is a clear and present danger if the Mexican drug cartels are emboldened and make more money? Does that endanger the United States? Yes, and because side? they're getting stronger, more powerful, and they're diversifying their portfolio. So they're Precisely. not just doing drugs and trafficking people, but it's illegal mining, illegal logging, counterfeit goods. Uh, Some of the worst people on the planet. It is, and they're getting stronger. So we have to, we really have to band together with all of our countries, um, all the countries mm. and all of the, uh, across the globe to counter this because they're taking advantage of countries that haven't uh, experienced right. this kind of activity before and this kind of crime. And they're so, behind the eight ball uh, trying to counter this before um, uh, trying to get ahead of it yeah. once it occurred. And I apologize for interrupting a little bit. I just have limited time. And as a 03, I don't usually uh, interrupt uh, <laughs> 010s. But um, so Mexican drug cartels present a clear and present danger. And they are charging, depending on um, who you talk to, between four and $7,000 per illegal migrant coming into the country. So it would stand to reason that the more illegal migrants crossing the southern border, the more emboldened the cartels get, the more power they get, the more they endanger the American people. And that's exactly why we want to limit the, uh, the, the illegal crossings on the southern border. And that's why, for instance, I'm also very concerned, and uh, we'll give it another go, General Guillo, with Chinese nationals crossing the southern border. There was a couple of years back where we had 450 apprehended, mostly military-aged men. Now, depending on who, again, what you, you talk to, it's 43,000, 50,000. Is that an alarming trend for you, General Guillo? Yes, Congressman, it is. Yeah, it, 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 tremendously so. And that's why, again, we have to do everything we can. Uh, Director Ray even said that, um, that there's ISIS elements that are also crossing the border uh, as well. So I, I just can't um, emphasize enough how important it is to take this seriously. I don't think it's a political matter. I think it's an absolute matter of national security. And uh, I thank you for coming today. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thanks. Chairman yields back. Chair, and I recognize the gentlelady from California, Ms. Jacobs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, as one of the few members on this committee who actually represent a border community, um, I feel like I just need to make sure we are setting the record straight on, on these issues. First of all, San Diego, the community I represent, is one of the safest cities in America, not despite being on the border, but I'd argue because of it. And I think my colleague from El Paso would likely say the same thing. Uh, and despite the fear mongering on display here today, uh, on my regular trips to the border, I think it's clear that the best way to actually weaken the drug cartels is to make sure that we have more legal pathways for people to come here and to make sure we can let our border patrol agents uh, actually focus on national security um, by, for instance, funding the child well-being program uh, so that we're not having border patrol acting like social workers. Um, and I would just, you know, all of the people they're saying on the terrorist watch list that we've seen come through, we know that because we have caught them, which means the system is actually working. So in any case, um, just wanted to, to put that at the top. Um, uh, General Richardson, I'd like to ask you actually about the Southcom Human Rights Office. Um, you know, it was established in the late 90s, and I think it's been a clear success in how we integrate human rights directly into daily operations. Um, could you speak to how the Human Rights Office has benefited Southcom, how it's improved the command's relationship with human rights advocates and civil society, and if there's anything more you need from us to best be able to utilize the Human Rights Office? So thank you for that, Congresswoman. The Human Rights Office in Southcom that we've had for over 20 years has been a huge enabler. And, uh, and the ability to, uh, you know, everything that we do, it's baked in. It's a, it's a core foundational principle. And human rights, the rule of law, and the professionalization of the militaries as we work with our military partners in the region, uh, that is at the top of the list. And then just uh, uh, infusing that in terms of all of the programs. And then it dovetails nicely into women, peace, and security, the integration of women into the forces, the militaries, and the public security forces. Our enlisted leader development program, which is a rock star program, that's what makes our US military so strong, is our uh, enlisted force. And what we do is we bring that, uh, that program to the region and help our partners make that stronger. And so uh, with my uh, Sergeant Major sitting behind me today, very, very proud of that program. And, but our human rights office, I just did a, a human rights engagement uh, last Friday, and I try to do that uh, just about every six months. Uh, I meet with human rights organizations um, when I travel in the region as well to hear their perspective. 
because it's a perspective that you have to understand, not just our military to military perspective, but what is happening on the ground, what they're seeing, what they're con uh, concerned about, uh, and uh, because that factors into everything that we do to help countries. And I think with the human rights uh, office that we've been able to, um, over the years with the relationships we built, but actually as, as uh, our partner nations have had to be mobilized to help their police. And we talk about, you know, honoring their constitution and the importance of honoring their constitution, not just a person uh, that, that might be in the leadership seat. Uh, when, when those gray zone areas come into effect, that's where we really see the, uh, the benefits of the hard work of our, our human rights office in Southcom. Thank you. And, and could you um, share a little bit about the 25th anniversary celebration that happened in Miami in 2022? So thank you for that. Uh, we had uh, numerous countries, close to 20 uh, partner nations that came, and there were so many people that wanted to come, and it was, we had just really extended an invitation to the, to the militaries, but ministers of defense wanted to come. Uh, a couple of congressional folks from the countries wanted to come too because they were so excited about it. And then we've had a couple of nations join the Human Rights Initiative. It's a non-binding agreement. It's just a commitment to double down on, on supporting human rights and being, uh, being aware of it and, uh, and the training that goes into the partner nations, uh, militaries and public security forces. Thank you. And in my last 30 seconds, could you just share how the Human Rights Office interacts with the civilian harm mitigation and response policy? And so the, uh, uh, the uh, CHIMER, as we call it, for the, uh, uh, as an acronym, but the, those meetings occur regularly with our uh, Office of the Secretary of Defense, so with OSD and the Joint Staff. And so the engagement and, uh, and the importance of that uh, only brings that up to a higher level with uh, a broader uh, engagement strategy. And so I appreciate the work by the Joint Staff and, uh, and OSD uh, to, to do that, that forum. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. McLean from Michigan is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here. General R Richardson, with the recent breakout in violence in Haiti, the administration has, done, um, has seemingly abandoned Americans abroad again. The administration was able to pull out State Department staff in our embassy this weekend but made little attempt to rescue other Americans on the island. While I appreciate the, part, the department's announced uh, additional funding for the MMS mission, the additional funding will not solve the problem. So General Richardson, um, my question is, were you contacted or consulted by anyone at the White House or the State Department about Americans uh, trapped in Haiti? Uh, regarding uh, Americans trapped in Haiti, no, we had uh, okay. we were pulling out non-essential uh, personnel. From so you the didn't US have embassy. any discussion regarding the Americans um, that were trapped in Haiti, just government officials or non-essential non -essential government personnel to to reduce that number. Was there any conversation among your staff on the rescue of the Americans in Haiti? What was the plan for those? There uh, possibly were discussions above my level uh, regarding that. And I know that as the political negotiations continue in Jamaica with our, uh, with our uh, Secretary of State and uh, CARICOM leaders uh, to try and get to a political solution on Haiti. So as of right now, what is the plan for the Americans trapped in Haiti? And so uh, the, uh, as we work forward, uh, the, uh, as the administration creates a, a requirement for DOD to, um, to bring out trapped Americans in Haiti, uh, we will absolutely do that from Southcom. And I can appreciate it, but as of right now, we don't have any plans to get Americans home. Uh, That's I, what I heard you say. I don't have a request for support to um, I just bring want, any Americans I appreciate out just that. yet. Thank you. Yet. And what is the situation, in your opinion, in Haiti right now? Well, the, uh, in terms of the violence uh, that, uh, that the gangs, um, the, over 300 gangs, about 7,200 gang members that we're tracking, and the activities that they've taken uh, over this past week to create violence. 
They've made four demands for the prime minister to resign, for elections to be held within 90 days, that they be given amnesty for uh, the crimes that they've been is it, they've committed. And again, ma'am, I don't mean to cut you off. Is the situation pretty dire over there, or is it business as usual in Haiti? No, I would say that they, because of what the gangs have done and taken advantage of the I prime agree. minister being out of the country, they've consolidated and conducted simultaneous attacks across. So Puerto pretty Prince. dire. Is that a fair so assessment, is, or am I over exaggerating? So the situation, the security situation, is dire in Haiti. Thank you. Yes. Was there any intelligence indicating the potential threat of a violent takeover prior to last week? Uh, that was not expected that the gangs would, we had not seen the gangs really work together or coordinate together before, uh, the, uh, once the prime minister left, there was no indication that they had done that before or that they were going to do that once he departed. So, so prior to, there was really no indication or no intel that we would end up in this situation, That correct? they would be working together and conducting simultaneous attacks, no. Okay. Ms. Zimmerman, did the Secretary of Defense consult with the Secretary of State regarding any options on protecting Americans in Haiti? Um, uh, thank you, Congresswoman, for that question. Um, the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of State, along with other members of the U.S. government, have had numerous discussions about Haiti uh, as this situation has continued to evolve. With respect to Americans uh, in particular, of course, uh, the Department maintains prudent planning for evacuations wherever we have diplomatic let, presences, let me be clear. but let the embassy me. remains open as of now. Um, okay. I, I'm asking these questions because this is the third time this administration has abandoned Americans abroad in dangerous situations. We don't have a plan to get them out. We had just said that. Last night, I coordinated with Congressman Corey Mills to rescue several Americans trapped in Port-au-Prince. Congressman Mills actually participated in the rescue of those Americans abandoned by the Biden administration and the State Department. So I ask you all, what exactly is the plan to get Americans trapped in Haiti out? We don't have one. Mr. Chairman, this administration doesn't seem to have a problem with abandoning Americans overseas. This is now the third instance where President Biden and Secretary Blinken have decided that American lives are Mr. irrelevant. Plain, time has First in Afghanistan, Israel, and now Haiti. I yield back. With that, Ms. Escobar from Texas is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'd like to thank our witnesses for your service and for your presence here today. This is such an important conversation. I'm eager to dive in, but first, um, I want to say we recently lost two New York guardsmen and a Border Patrol agent, and I'd like to express my condolences, uh, especially to the families and, and recognize their incredible service. Um, General Richardson, I, I want to thank you in particular for all of the engagement that uh, I've had the uh, honor and privilege to have with you over the years. Thank you for your leadership. I have the incredible honor of representing El Paso, Texas, which is home to Fort Bliss. And uh, over the course of that time, uh, you know, I will share one of the, the frustrations for me has been that Congress has not focused on the Western Hemisphere uh, to the extent that I believe we need to. And when we are um, encountering challenges at our nation's front door, uh, it's, it's, that's an example of us acting too slowly and not quickly enough. And uh, you know, as I listened to one of uh, my colleagues on the other side of the dais talk about the border, which again, I, I I agree with my colleague, um, uh, Ms. Jacobs, uh, you know, presents challenges, but border communities like El Paso are among the safest in the nation for a reason. Um, but as we think about challenges that we face at the border, we've got to think about investments beyond the border and strategies beyond the border if, if we want to be successful. And, and that's what I'd like to focus on, actually, with my first question 
beginning with you, General Richardson. Southcom in particular is one theater where our dollars, though small in comparison to investments in other theaters, can stretch quite far in terms of return on investment. There is immense value in looking to secure our homeland and address these threats at the source before they arrive at our door. Can you give us some insight on the feedback you're getting from our personnel in Southcom, as well as the counterparts of our co cooperating nations on the value of these dollars? What risks do we take on by under-investing in these efforts, especially in an era of great power competition? Yeah, so the, thanks, Congresswoman, and uh, thank you for your service. And, um, and so certainly the investment that we make with our partner nations in security cooperation, uh, and I mentioned the, uh, the work that Colombia and Panama do together. So as migrants flow out of uh, Venezuela looking for a better life and uh, being able to get food and health care and, and, uh, and be safe, uh, the operations that the military is doing to go after the, the, criminal, uh, the criminal gangs in Colombia and then the border forces, Center Front and Sanan in Panama, as they work to do the same thing uh, to go after the criminal groups that are uh, conducting all the crimes, the, the, counter, the, the drug trafficking, the human trafficking, illegal mining, logging, all of it, counterfeit goods. And as they've done these uh, operations against these criminal groups and transnational criminal organizations, they've actually um, been able to uh, 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 find all these other things, all these counterfeit goods, uh, the drugs, the human trafficking. And so they've actually doubled down uh, operations and continue those operations, which they started last April in 2023, and they've continued those uh, to get after uh, the, you know, helping in their respect to, re to try and reduce uh, migration and the criminals that are doing the human trafficking. And so the investment that we make with our partners is, is huge uh, in terms of them being able to counter the threats inside of their countries. And I think that they're, they're doing uh, everything that they can to get after that. Uh, but as their laws, some of their laws don't facilitate stopping migration and, uh, and uh, stemming the flow. We see activities to do that, but their laws don't support the military and police to do that as a see human right as a uh, uh, migration as a human right. Thank you, General Richardson. In, in my closing few seconds, I would just say I am equally alarmed by the growing sophistication and power of the cartels. They are a, a global threat, but one of the ways to address the cartels and undercut them and take vulnerable humans out of the hands of them as human traffickers would be for us to, for Congress to open up legal pathways um, in, instead of, uh, you know, what I consider a dereliction of our responsibility to reform outdated immigration laws for decades. Thank you all again for your service. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Waltz from Florida is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, two weeks ago, the FBI's Miami field office issued a public alert seeking information on Majid Farhani, a member of Iran's Ministry of Intelligence and Security who's been recruiting individuals, quote, for operations in the U.S. to include lethal targeting of current and former government officials. Those are the Trump administration cabinet officials that to this day have to have security because of the threat uh, from Iranian operatives on American soil, and they're seeking to avenge the 2020 death of Qasem Soleimani. Uh, as you all know, the Justice Department has convicted uh, a, an Iranian operative for cooperating with Mexican tar cartels uh, and conspiring to blow up a restaurant here in Washington, D.C. Uh, some years ago. So, General Richardson, has Iran attempted or is Iran using Venezuela as a springboard to launch clandestine operations in the United States? Uh, the, I'd be able to talk to you about that in a, better in a closed session, but in terms of the... Well, we, I mean, it's uh, publicly reported, General, that the Maduro regime is cooperating with, with Iran, is providing documentation to help them get into the United States. I mean, this is for the American people to understand. With the we have a public notice. Yes, of their uh, cooperation and activities with, with China, Russia, and Iran. Um, can you comment to the level of cooperation? 
Uh, I mean, the Maduro regime is sponsoring and facilitating these activities, right? Uh, yes, they are sponsoring activities and, uh, and allowing visits to occur and the cooperation that they do with these countries. And so it, let the record show the Maduro regime, uh, where we have now uh, are easing sanctions, this administration is easing sanctions under the Barbados Agreement, is facilitating assassins to come into the United States to assassinate senior American uh, officials. General Richardson uh, also changing topics to the narcotics that are flowing into uh, this country. Jide of South currently employs a special, um, a, a ship special mission, which is essentially a refueling uh, resupply ship uh, to allow our partners to extend their range. We have one, uh, which is, I think, incredibly valuable, but Ms. Zimmerman, I'm surprised uh, that we've received a report back from the Pentagon that adding another ship so that we can interdict on the Pacific and the Caribbean, uh, the Pentagon is basically saying there's a, there's a low return on investment there. Can you explain to the mothers and fathers in Florida, the families that are being devastated by the flow of fentanyl and other drugs into this country, why one resupply ship? Not for the US Navy, but to help our partners extend their range and interdict these drugs is, is not a good investment of their dollars? Uh, Congressman, I'd like to take that back and get you a more detailed answer. You don't have an answer? I mean, you have a report saying that it wasn't uh, we, a good investment. We do. I, I okay. understand that we're working to make sure the best use of our resources, but I'd like to get you a more specific answer. Thank you. I'll look for that for the record, and I, I do find it disturbing you don't have that, uh, you, you don't have that information given your portfolio. Can we just talk uh, a bit more about Haiti? U.S. citizens are trapped in Haiti. We have a member of Congress leading a group down to rescue U.S. citizens from orphanages. We've had multiple members of Congress rescuing U.S. citizens that were trapped in the West Bank and elsewhere in Israel, that were trapped and are still trapped in Afghanistan. Uh, we have a breakdown here between the State Department and DOD in terms of having assets and resources available to go get Americans. I mean, it's just a basic function. Uh, and at this point, I was informed last night that the State Department revoked the clearance for these individuals to land in the Dominican Republic. So can you, can you just talk to me more broadly about our, not a NEO for just the embassy, the embassy personnel get taken care of. I'm worried about Americans that are trapped uh, in this deteriorating situation. General Richardson, Ms. Zimmerman, can you just talk about what we have positioned? Because if we have a mass, not only to get Americans, but is Guantanamo ready to take on what could be a mass refugee flow onto Florida shores? So we have plans ready, Congressman, in terms of a non-combatant evacuation, a NEO plan, also a mass migration plan that we would uh, establish what about for US citizens? on Gitmo. And if we get a request uh, from the State Department in order to do that, we have a plan to do that. Gentlemen Thank you. I'll take that up with State. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Carbajal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member. And thank you to all the witnesses for being here today. Uh, the political crisis in Haiti, Venezuela, and other countries in the Western Hemisphere have put the United States in a difficult situation at the border. I'm eager to hear your plans to overcome some of these challenges, as well as plans to influence and sustain advantages with China and Russia to gain foothold in our backyard. Thank you, Congressman. And, uh, and so certainly the funding that I received last year to increase my security cooperation initiatives uh, was hugely helpful. And, uh, and the uh, funding that we would receive this year uh, as soon as the defense bills are uh, approved uh, will be uh, extremely important uh, to continue that effort. But I would say 15 to 20 years of getting less than 50% of the requirement for security cooperation for Southcom and the investment that that brings, that uh, it, it can't be made up in just one or two years. So uh, the sustained funding and the predictable funding is very, very important. And so, but it's not, a, it's not just the security cooperation, it's the exercises. It's our ability of the, of the uh, process with foreign military cells, excess defense articles, 
As our nations are dealing with very old equipment, uh, outdated ground-based radar systems so they can see threats and things like that, uh, we've got to continue to work hard. And the Secretary of Defense has led a program to speed that up uh, with the foreign military sales and things like that to deliver capability uh, much, much quicker. And I appreciate the interagency's work on that. And then the work we've done with the whole of government and the interagency to bring together all those instruments of national power that I talked about in my opening statement, not just on the military side of the house, it's working together, the diplomats, the information environment, the military and the economics. Because we are, we are doing a lot of things, we just gotta integrate and synchronize a little bit better from Team USA in support of Team, team Democracy. Thank you, General. General Richardson, as the ranking member of the Coast Guard and Maritime Transportation Subcommittee, I am focused on Jayat of South, this detection and monitoring operations in your AOR. What support do you need to accomplish your objectives for better drug interdiction? So the work that uh, Jayat of South has done with the interagency, we have just a, a huge synergy with Jayat of South and the law enforcement community and the interagency. And so uh, to continue to build that, and every year our partner nations' uh, abilities to utilize that detection and monitoring, both our law enforcement, but partner nations too, uh, because we want that uh, in terms of them being able to increase the, the interdictions as a result of that information. And that continues to go up every year. It's 76% by our partner nations. And so... Um, we see that they are very effective. Um, the, the ship special mission was brought up uh, before that. A second uh, SSM would be hugely helpful and would uh, definitely uh, raise the bar for Jayat of South and the ability to uh, work with partner nations. And so uh, the, the funding and the resourcing that's provided for Jayat of South and that ability for them to only continuous uh, enable uh, those interdictions and disruptions is very helpful. Thank you. Uh, General Gio, congratulations on your new command. As China continues its goal to project power outside of its borders, what new developments have resulted from China's risky and aggressive intercepts of U.S. aircraft operating internationally that concern in regard to your primary mission to defend the homeland? Congressman, uh, fortunately, we haven't seen uh, uh, Chinese aircraft operate near our defense, uh, uh, or excuse me, air defense identification zones yet, but I think that that's coming uh, as early as this year. Um, that shows an uh, overall concern I have about the growing capability of, of uh, China, uh, not only with the aircraft, as you just uh, mentioned, but also with uh, ships and even uh, submarines being able to range further from China and closer to, to our shores. Thank you. General Richardson, with the 25 seconds I have left, hundreds of thousands of Venezuelan migrants have made their way north uh, due to years of long economic and humanitarian crisis. Can you, can you speak about how Southern Command is collaborating with the State Department to alleviate this crisis? So the work that, uh, that we do, uh, very strong relationship with Department of State, with all the ambassadors in the region, and then the work that, uh, that we've done to work with our partners. Gentlemen's uh, time has expired, Chair, and I recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Gates. So what's the difference between Haiti and a failed state? It's telling, right? We can't really identify them because the gangs are in charge, the government has been thrown out, and as a Florida man, I'm deeply concerned about this wave of people that we're about to have, that we are having, coming from Haiti, and it will accelerate because I've gone to Opelaka and I've spent time with the folks that are engaged in Operation Vigilant Century, and they say the number one push factor that drives these Haitians into Broward County, Palm Beach County, where they don't disperse throughout the country, they stay in Southeast Florida, that, that that driving factor is the deterioration of conditions in Haiti. So what are we doing to prepare for that wave and to ensure that these people are not paroled into the United States as the administration has done with people on the southern border, but instead are repatriated back at the dock at Port-au-Prince? 
Uh, Congressman, we're doing a number of things to ensure that we're keeping track of the situation and we're prepared. At the moment, we have not yet seen large numbers, what we would characterize as a, as a maritime mass migration. Um, but Do we are alert to that. Mass migration, though? We, are, we are alert to that possibility. Um, I think you're right uh, that the, the driving conditions in Haiti could very well press more people. So uh, we've recently approved some uh, additional assistance that we can provide to uh, the Coast Guard. I I, I think that that has now fully been approved. Uh, we'll be providing notifications if we haven't already uh, uh, to so, okay, provide additional shipboard there. assistance. Because I've talked to the Coast Guard, and what they say would really support them would be more naval vessels, would be DOD support. And because I think you correctly said that there is an anticipated mass migration here, there are specific legal authorities that we can access, that I would implore you to access. Specifically, George W. Bush signed executive order uh, 13276. And in that executive order, there is the ability for any president to designate an anticipated mass migration and then get gray hull naval vessels into the Straits of Florida to deter that migration and then to repatriate those people before they get to Florida. So General Richardson, is it your best military advice based on what we just heard from Ms. Zimmerman that we activate the authorities anticipating a mass migration? So I think that we need to be postured appropriately uh, for that, uh, exactly what you're talking about. And I have put in a request for increased capability to do exactly that. And, uh, and we are ready if a mass migration, if we need to deal with a mass migration. We did a full walkthrough of our contingency plan on Gitmo last summer with all of the interagency and all of my components. When I talk to the Coast Guard folks, they seem to say that we don't have to go drop these folks off at Gitmo, where they, they become a burden on the U.S. taxpayer. We can interdict at sea and then repatriate directly at Port-au-Prince. When you say you're preparing for that, does that specifically mean DOD assets? So for what happens on a daily basis that the Coast Guard is doing and the repatriation under Homeland Security authorities back to Cap Haitian happens on a daily basis. Yeah, so no, I, I got that. But what the co when I go down to Opelika and, and get eyeball to eyeball with these folks, they say, Congressman, we really could use the DOD assistance, not more money for the Coast Guard, not more meetings, conference calls, and committees, but gray hull vessels in the Straits of Florida doing the interdictions, doing the repatriations. So when you say you're, you're anticipating, I think Ms. Zimmerman laid it out correctly, so given the, the fact that an anticipated maritime mass migration is specifically contemplated pursuant to 46 U.S.C. 70051, can, can I leave this discussion <laughs> believing that it will be your best military advice uh, to the administration to utilize DOD assets for this purpose, General Richards? If I'm requested to do that, I will definitely do that. And no, I, I want you to make the request, not be requested. That's what I'm trying to ascertain. Okay. Yes, con Congressman. Yes, you, you will make that request for DOD so assets. So I will in the talk of with District 7 and our Coast Guard on the, on the Atlantic side, uh, Atlantic area, and uh, see if they need additional uh, gray, DOD gray holes. They have not requested that specifically from Southcom. And so, but if there's a need for that, I would absolutely request it. Thank you for that, because I, I really think getting ahead of this will ensure that the humanitarian conditions um, uh, will, will be far better, that we could perhaps deter some of this, uh, because, I mean, it's tragic conditions. When you talk to these folks and they say that these Haitians are pouring gasoline on little babies and doing everything they can to deter interdictions, um, it, it sharpens the minds of my fellow Floridians to want to make sure you guys are doing everything possible. And I greatly appreciate the exchange today. Yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair, and I recognize the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Courtney. <clears throat> thank you, uh, Chairman Rogers, and thank you to all the witnesses um, for your uh, testimony today. Uh, General Geo, um, again, it was a pleasure to meet you, and congratulations again on your uh, uh, new assignment. Um, in your testimony, you spoke about you spoke about the ability to detect, classify, and track potential threats to the homeland from the seafloor to space in the cyber domain is a critical need for U.S. NORTHCOM and NORAD, and that investments and capabilities such as the integrated undersea surveillance system, the IUSS, will significantly enhance domain awareness to limit competitors' ability to approach North America undetected. Can you speak a little more again? I know in your written testimony you mentioned the fact that now um, Russia is about to deploy another Severodvinsk, um, which again would be um, 
on the West Coast. They already, in 2014, they deployed their first severed events, which uh, again has been, um, you know, a real challenge for uh, anti-submarine warfare and our allies working together to, to um, you know, keep an eye on that. And the IUSS um, is, again, an, another capability. Um, again, could you talk uh, again about, you know, the, the homelands facing something that we really haven't seen since the Cold War in terms of the undersea and, and um, would appreciate your thoughts. Congressman, you're, you're exactly right. The, uh, the under, ability to detect with undersea sensors is more important today than ever before because of the advances in the SEV, as you mentioned, uh, now a threat to both coasts, uh, and, and the uh, quiet nature with which those uh, submarines can operate mean that they could uh, very easily get much closer to the uh, U.S. and then deploy their uh, a large arsenal of cruise missiles uh, to a point where if that were allowed to happen, the first detection we would likely get would be, could be the explosions of the, uh, of the cruise missiles. So uh, keeping our undersea advantage is imperative, and I think the, the first step in that is to increase our undersea sensor capability to allow us to detect these threats further away from the U.S. shores than we can today. Well, thank you. And as we discussed, I mean, the, the present <clears throat> uh, situation, at least on the Atlantic, is, uh, is a team sport with our allies um, in the air, on the surface, and under the surface in terms of trying to track um, that, that threat. I, I remember um, Admiral Ruffhead, who was the former CNO, uh, one time saying that the, the best anti-submarine warfare is another submarine. I mean, that obviously also has to be kind of um, viewed as a priority uh, if, if, again, we're going to have an effective um, system of defense. Is that correct? Sir, it is absolutely correct. And uh, we get great partnership, uh, especially in the Atlantic. We have a one Atlantic uh, t technique, tactic, technique, and procedure where NORTHCOM, UCOM, and Southern Command with General Richardson all share information, and we don't use the strict line that you see on the UCP map as uh, a, a way to limit our capability. We allow forces to flow freely across all those lines wherever it makes sense for that other, uh, you know, for the overall situation, even if it goes between combatant commands to ensure that we can detect. And then once we get those uh, undersea uh, uh, submarines, track and follow them uh, to ensure that they don't become a threat to the United States. And with the severed events now on the West Coast, um, again, that's just another mission um, that, again, it, we don't quite have the same um, team lineup uh, in that part of the world. So it's, uh, it's if anything, it's more um, uh, demand to the Navy. Uh, yes, Congressman, you're right. And, and the fact that the Pacific is so much larger and you know we're now facing two threats there with a, with a Russian specific threat and then also the uh, Chinese uh, makes the uh, Pacific threat uh, a particular concern of mine and, and Northcoms. Well thank you. Um, you know again your timing uh, in terms of this discussion is um, you know very apt since we got a budget yesterday which talks about <coughs> cutting a Virginia class submarine um, from the Navy shipbuilding plan. And uh, obviously, you know, not just in NORTHCOM, but in, frankly, every command, that's gonna just, again, make a, a high demand uh, platform uh, even more stressed. So, um, you know, this is gonna be very helpful for us as we move towards uh, markup later um, this session. That I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Uh, before I recognize uh, Mr. Bacon, I want to announce we're going to be going uh, up to the classified uh, portion of this hearing in about 15 minutes. Uh, Mr. Bacon, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I welcome all three of you here. Thank you. And I've enjoyed working with General Richardson in recent years, so I appreciate seeing you. And General Guillo and I were fellow commanders of the Fighting 55th Wing, uh, the largest wing in Air Combat Command, third largest in the Air Force. I think for two decades, the most busy Op tempo, ops tempo that the Air Force had. So congrats on your new position. Uh, my first question is for General Guillo. Uh, how does hypersonic weapons affect your warning times? Because I think it's important for the Americans to hear, with China having nuclear-armed hypersonics, Russian building them, what does it do for our warning times? Uh, thank you, Congressman. Uh, good to see you, and, and uh, thanks for recognizing the fight in 55th's contributions worldwide. Uh, Hypersonics are, are probably the most destabilizing weapon that we face now, and uh, one of the prime reasons is, is what you mentioned, the shortened detection time, uh, and the fact that they don't follow a, a traditional tr uh, ballistic 
track means they're very unpredictable and the area of uncertainty is, is huge based on their speed and their maneuverability. Uh, that's what makes them such a, such a challenge to not only detect but to track and eventually defeat. Is it fair to say we have about a 15 minute warning time? I don't know, if, I'm just trying to give our, our citizens a sense of how this changes. Intercontinental ballistic missiles gave us about a 35 minute warning time and I'm just trying to, how much is this warning time reduced? Uh, yes, Congressman. There, there are cases where it would be about half, and but I, th I would add to that though is the unpredictable nature okay. of their maneuvering. Even with a uh, ICBM, if it was 30 minutes, very quickly we could figure out just about where exactly that's going into a you know very small circle circle of uh, error probability. However, with the hypersonic, not only is it faster, giving us less time to detect, it can uh, fly lower. Uh, which which gives our sensors problems, and then that maneuverability means it, it uh, you know a typical threat warning could be something as vague as Western United States as opposed to a particular city. And Mr. Chairman, this is why I think it's so important that we address this with Stratcom and the Pentagon and our just our national command authorities. I don't think we're positioned right with our nuclear command survivability and ensuring that we always have a survivable element, not at a base. Uh, I think we're putting, making ourselves vulnerable. It's one of the things I'm trying to push our DOD. I know this is not a NORTHCOM's uh, purview, but I think we as in the, in, this, in the HASC here, working with senior military leaders, are going to have to come up with a plan that ensures we always have a survivable command element, that we can't be caught flat-footed. Because I worry about the current, our current posture, and I think it leaves us vulnerable. And I want the Russians, Chinese to know, no matter what they do, we can always respond. Uh, so, by, so I appreciate what your aspect of this is very important in this discussion, so thank you. John Richardson, I was talking to the previous ambassador from Jamaica, and he was telling me that the Jamaicans would like to have our Coast Guard assigned there, and they would help with facilities, and it's in the perfect position for interdicting drugs coming out of Venezuela and Colombia. Now, can you comment on that at all, or have you heard any of this dialogue? I have not heard that dialogue, uh, but we, work, we have a very good close working relationship with Jamaica and, uh, and the Chief of Defense there who is a, a Coast Guard officer. Well, I'm hearing, this is indirect, not direct from him, uh, but via the ambassador, that this is an opportunity, and this is from the Jamaicans' perspective, that they'd like to work with us and that that location is, would be important you know, for the drug routes coming out of Colombia and Venezuela. So I hope you take a look at it. I would be uh, grateful for that. Now going back to General Guillo, how's our surveillance radars? Do they need investment, the current? Congressman, they do. Uh, we do have some programs in place, most uh, notably the over-the-horizon radar system. Uh, that would give us uh, capability against cruise missiles, traditional air tracks, as well as the hypersonics that you and I just discussed. Uh, keeping that uh, program on track is the number one priority uh, from NORTHCOM because of that great capability that it would bring. How would you prioritize the ABM elements that we have in Alaska? Do, the, do they need upgrading as well? The, uh, yes, all, all of the systems that we have that allow, uh, give us the domain awareness that we need mm -hmm. uh, are, are at the top priorities uh, of mine. The, um, there would be one of these uh, over the horizon systems there, the LRDR, the uh, long range discriminating radar is key uh, for us to defeat uh, uh, missiles from North Korea. Thank you very much. I uh, appreciate all three of you. I yield back. Chair, now recognize the gentleman from Nevada, Mr. Horsford. Thank you, uh, Chairman Rogers, and to the ranking member uh, for holding this important hearing. Um, General Richardson, it is uh, good to see you again. Um, last year, I was in Trinidad and Tobago attending the CARICOM uh, Heads of Government Conference. Uh, during that trip and in meetings afterward, I've had uh, several conversations with regional partners uh, discussing how the United States and the Caribbean must work together to address challenges in the region. Uh, today's resignation of Prime Minister Henry of Haiti as a result of increased gang violence really further highlights the fact that regional security, economic growth, and addressing the climate crisis, as well as energy resiliency, are all imperative to the success of the region. So, General, um, how do you believe that the United States 
uh, would work with Caribbean nations to address these shared issues and to create long-lasting partnerships in order to show an alternative to China's influence in the region. Yes, yeah, so the, uh, thank you, Congressman. And the, uh, the work that we do with the Caribbean is extremely important because of, uh, obviously, how close the Caribbean is to our, our homeland. And so the security cooperation, the exercises, the regional conference uh, that I do to bring leaders together, uh, but not just talk about things, actually uh, have deliverable, deliverables on getting after those challenges that we identify during the conferences um, is, is what we have really put emphasis on. And so uh, with cyber, with critical infrastructure, and uh, the activities that we do in the exercise program. Well, I'm glad to see that the department is taking uh, these challenges seriously. I, I look forward to continuing to work uh, with the department and this committee uh, to address the threats uh, facing our national security and the immediate risk uh, that, that faces uh, us uh, with the situation in Haiti. Uh, Assistant Secretary Zimmerman, uh, I agree with you that the challenge of natural and man-made hazards do not wait for us to resolve other ongoing national security crises. We must act now. How is the Department of Defense taking into account climate resiliency in its everyday decision-making process? Uh, Congressman, thank you so much. Uh, climate resilience has become an important part of uh, how we do business, not just in terms of looking directly at climate change as, as an issue, but really in terms of how we integrate across the range of activities that the department does in order to ensure that we have the operational advantage wherever we need it. Uh, so an example would be uh, in the Pacific, uh, the Ronald Reagan Missile Defense Test Range uh, sits on a site that I think is only six feet above sea level. And uh, with the challenge of sea level rise, uh, we have to make sure that we're taking the steps to enforce that infrastructure so that we can continue to do what we need to do from a security perspective. Likewise, I think another example I would give would be in the Arctic, where uh, climate change happening uh, at a rate uh, three times that that we see in certain other places has opened up new approaches and has made it really an arena for strategic competition. So we see the military of the Arctic by Russia, China considering itself as a near-Arctic nation, and that creates a lot of dilemmas that I think we have to ensure that we're on top of. And then the last I will say is that um, when we see extreme weather here in the homeland, uh, that is something that we need to respond to in support of uh, our uh, civil authorities when they ask for it and when we can do so without affecting readiness. But that, uh, that increasing challenge, the number of incidents that we are now responding to, I think also creates um, the possibility that we'll be uh, stretched more thinly. I, I would add, uh, obviously, the Western Hemisphere, the devastating storms, droughts, and flooding which have inflamed conflicts and contributed to instability and mass migration. Uh, so how can the department then, uh, Assistant Secretary Zimmerman, uh, better partner with these vulnerable countries so that existing risks are not exacerbated by these extreme weather events? Um, one of the ways that we're looking to do that is through our security cooperation efforts. So uh, we have uh, recently initiated a program called DORIC, which works with partners right now in uh, the Western Hemisphere and Africa uh, to try to gear some of our, we have uh, I think $10 million uh, this year and we'll be renewing that. Uh, which works with our partners to build partner capacity in areas that affect uh, climate change or affected by climate change. Great. Gentlemen's time has expired. Chair, and I recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Jimenez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we could put the entire, entire U.S. fleet and the entire uh, assets of the Coast Guard in the Florida Straits, and it wouldn't matter um, if we had the wrong policy. So, Ms. Zimmerman, Ms. Zimmerman, do you know what the Biden administration policy is towards if we if we face a mass mi migration from Haiti what is the uh, Biden administration policy uh, I think our policy remains as it has been that we will uh, endeavor to, to conduct repatriation as, as soon as practicable um, as General Richardson outlined if the president does declare um, a Caribbean mass migration we have additional tools that the department will be able to leverage in terms of uh, directly responding ourselves so you expect the uh, spec if anybody interdicted uh, on the way to the United States will be 
will be returned back to Haiti to their country of origin? Uh, that is pursuant to, to laws and policy. Okay. And you haven't heard it otherwise from the Biden administration? Uh, I, have, I have not. Okay. Uh, switching gears here. Uh, uh, General Richardson, good to see you. Uh, I've been down to South America, and, and I can say that um, everybody really, really uh, appreciates you down uh, in South America. And um, uh, fentanyl, who's, who is, who's producing it? Who's, who is uh, transporting the fentanyl into the United States? And so what, what we see in, uh, in the Southcom AOR in terms of fentanyl is more of the medical fentanyl that's being uh, stolen out of the hospitals and things like that. Uh, in terms of the uh, precursor chemicals that are coming in, we're starting to see a little bit of that. Uh, I think that that is just the beginning possibly in this region. And so um, obviously working with our partners as they're discovering this and those sorts of things of where these precursor chemicals are coming and then putting together by the uh, cartels and then uh, funneled into Mexico or put together in Mexico. And right. in I only States. got five minutes, so I have to, I have to go. S Senator, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, General Guillot, is that's your name? Yeah, G General Guillot. Okay, Guillot. so Mexico. The fentanyl is flowing in from Mexico. Who's, 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 who's manufacturing it? Who's, uh, who's transporting it? Uh, Congressman, as General Richardson said, uh, we see the, uh, the precursor elements being uh, brought in from abroad, uh, many or much from China, and then uh, assembled there under the, um, under the cartels and then distributed from there. So if I were to tell you that the fentanyl has killed more Americans by far, than all the Americans we lost in Vietnam, in Afghanistan, in Iraq. Uh, would that surprise you? Unfortunately, Congressman, it would not. Uh, I'm aware of that. So, so the Chinese are, are shipping the, the, the precursor chemicals to their allies, the multinational uh, criminal organizations based out of Mexico and other places. They then uh, manufacture it, then send it to the United Still States, and kills Americans. Is that fair to say? Yes, Congressman. Um, and since back in 2001, a group of 19 terrorists came and killed 3,000 Americans, and then we waged war like 7,000 miles away for 20 years. What do you think our response should be to some organizations that are killing tens of thousands of Americans every single year? Sir, I think uh, Northcom is is uh, ready to support within the within the policy and has directed uh, at this point to address the threat. Uh, we're we're providing uh, intelligence support to the lead federal agencies that are that are addressing that and working with the uh, Mexican agencies. Uh, and our contribution to that is is intelligence support. I think our this government is failing the American people in a very big way, failing to protect our our. Children, it's the big, it's the largest cause of death of uh, men and women from 18, I think, to like 49 in the United States. And our duty, our collective duty, is to protect the citizens of the United States. That's the number one duty that we have, and we're failing miserably at it. Not you, because you you only follow orders, but this administration is failing miserably at protecting the United States. Um, my time's just about up, so thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, we will now adjourn this open session and reconvene the classified session in room 2212 in about five minutes. <laughs>